Bad Moon Rising, A Cory Sloan Witch Mystery, Cory Sloan Witch Mysteries, Book 3, written by Tegan Marr, narrated by Megan Kelly. Chapter 1 Something's in the air, I said to Sam, my second-in-command, as I tossed down my pen and leaned back in my chair. I frowned and kicked my feet up on the corner of my desk, trying to nail down what it was that was making me so edgy. He took his eyes off the report he was filling out and looked at me over the tops of his readers. You've been saying that. You know I'm a big fan of following your gut, but we've had nothing but peace and quiet for a month. You're probably just still keyed up a little from the past couple of months. It might take a bit for you to recover. I sighed. There wasn't a shred of evidence to indicate everything wasn't just the way it should be in our sleepy little town, yet I couldn't shake the feeling that a storm was brewing just on the other side of the horizon. I know, and I hope I'm wrong. I chewed on my lip and tried to shake the feeling of impending doom from my shoulders. I hoped he was right. There had been a lot of upheaval. What, with two murders running roughshod through Castle's Bluff two months running but this felt different to me. Tell you what, he said, signing his name to the noise complaint he'd just finished. Let's go grab some lunch and talk to Sully. Maybe he can shed some light on things for you. My stomach rumbled at the thought of a burger from Sully's, the pub right across the street from the courthouse. I dropped my feet from my desk and stood up. Might as well. Even if he doesn't have any intel... I'm not getting anything done here anyway. He lifted one corner of his mouth in a wry half-smile. I would have gladly let you talk to Ms. Wilson if you needed something to do. I didn't think she was ever going to stop complaining. That was par for the course with Gertrude Wilson. She was 80 and in the office at least once every couple of weeks complaining about one thing or another. Last week, she'd been miffed because... Wild hoodlums were riding their skateboards down the sidewalk, claiming she felt so unsafe she was about to start locking her front door at night. They weren't doing anything other than annoying her for the whole three seconds it took them to get by her house. But I'd learned long ago that expecting logic or a grain of tolerance from her was outside the realm of reality. Of course, she named names. The kids who'd made her list were all honors students, or close to it, on their way to the local youth center, where we'd built a skate area. Since the idea behind the park was to keep the kids out of trouble, I wasn't about to get on to them. Still, I'd assured her I'd look into it. One of the youth center's volunteers worked at the sheriff's office with me and assured me that the boys were, indeed, using the facilities almost every day. I counted that as due diligence and left it alone. I figured something else would attract her ire in a few days anyway, and I'd be right. No way, I said as he unfolded his tall frame from behind the desk. Even in late middle age, he still carried himself like a soldier, back straight and shoulders squared. It was your turn. Besides, she likes you better. She thinks I'm too young to be sheriff and says I'm lippy. Plus... I'm not tall, dark, and handsome. He grumbled, but mostly because it was true. We teased him because when it was his turn to deal with her, there was much more eye-batting and preening going on than actual complaining. As a matter of fact, you should just give in and ask her out. I tried to keep a straight face as I said it. Sam scowled and reached out to pinch my cheek, a movie new annoyed me. Lucky for him, he'd known me all my life and was 35 years older than me, so he always got a pass. Keep it up, kiddo. If the thought of dealing with her for an entire afternoon didn't make me want to set myself on fire, I'd ask her to your next cookout. If you did that, I'd set you on fire. I barbecued at the house I shared with my roommate and best friend most weekends, and when Sam wasn't covering for me, he always came. Food that didn't come in a frozen cardboard box was a big draw for a single guy. We passed Ms. Ellen, our elderly receptionist, on the way out. Heading to lunch? 
she asked, her eyes huge behind her bejeweled cat's eye glasses. Yeah, we're just running over to Sully's if you need us. Do you want to go? I asked. She'd been around since God was a boy and had manned the front desk of the sheriff's office since before I could remember. She didn't accept my offer often, but I always felt rude not asking. Besides, on the rare occasions she did accept, she was a hoot. She knew everything about everybody, it seemed, and it was funny learning about how the town and the people in it behaved in different decades. And last week. I swear, the woman had eyes everywhere. She waved us off. Nah, you two kids go ahead. If anything comes up, I'll call. It was only a hundred yards or so across the street to the pub, but the weather was unusually warm for October. The cool interior was great, and thanks to my wolfy side, it didn't take my eyes long to adjust to the dim interior. Sully, the Irish owner, stood behind the bar as he had since I was little, polishing wine glasses and smiling. There were several tables, but nobody at the bar, which is where I usually sat. He tossed the bar towel over his shoulder and lumbered toward us, stopping to pour two glasses of tea on his way. He was a bear shifter, and both his appearance and personality reflected it. Though he could easily crush beer cans in the bend of his arm, he was a marshmallow inside, at least until he wasn't. Good to see you, lass, Sam, he boomed. Are you hungry or just here for some quiet space? Sam and I often escaped to Sully's when we needed to discuss business in private. Translation, we went there when we saw Ms. Wilson sneak in, had a case involving a supernatural person, or wanted to plan a surprise party for somebody in the office. Or when we were just bored out of our minds and wanted to play some video golf. Don't judge, we're salaried. Today, though, my heart wasn't in it. The stupid black cloud just wouldn't clear out. The bell rang over the door when a customer came in, and I jumped. Sully furrowed his brow. What's got your knickers bunched, lass? You're like a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. I gave a small smile at the southern expression delivered in an Irish brogue. I don't know, Sully. I feel like trouble's coming. He pressed his lips together and nodded. I've been feeling it myself, lass. There's a bad moon rising, at least if you have bad intentions, so I wouldn't be surprised. Bad moon rising? Sam asked. I thought that was just a Creedence Clearwater revival song. Sully shook his head. If the moon's wonky, expect anything, and there's serious wonky coming up. Super blue blood moon in a couple of days. There's a reason farmers, midwives, witches, and other folks close to the earth work with the moon's schedule. They know, and this time around, it's on Halloween, when the veil is thinnest. Yeah, I said. We never schedule pact meetings when anything is going on with the moon. Even plain old full moons or new moons, let alone ones that occur in tandem with each other. Things are touchy enough as it is without adding a lunar havoc. What the hell is a super blue blood moon? Sam asked, confusion etched upon his face. It's either super good or incredibly bad, depending upon the magical user's intention, I said. A supermoon is closer to the Earth than usual. A blue moon is the second full moon in a month. Both of them individually make magic stronger, especially for spell work. A blood moon is... I know what a blood moon is, he said. It's been all over the news for months. That's the eclipse, right? Yeah, Sully said. It's a great time for endings and new beginnings. Put them all together and toss in Halloween, and you have some serious juju, even if the magical person isn't usually all that strong. I'd forgotten it was a blue moon. As a werewolf, I just kept track of when they were, not so much how many times they occurred. Since I was just learning to be a witch, spell work wasn't such a big deal in my training yet. I did know about the other three, though, and they were troubling enough. A prickly feeling ran across my body, and I shivered. Sam felt it and glanced at me. 
You okay? I know you can't be cold. Yeah, I replied. Somebody just walked over my grave is all. At any rate, Sully said, giving me a concerned glance. There's trouble coming, and it ain't gonna be pretty. I feel it in my bones. Just then, my phone rang, and a finger of dread slithered down my spine. Before I even answered, I knew trouble had arrived. Chapter 2 Sheriff, you need to get out to the Hutchinson's old hunting cabin. Miss Ellen said without preamble or nonsense when I answered. Some hikers stopped for lunch and found a body. I couldn't get much more than that out of the kid that called, except an... The body's all ripped open. Sam was sitting right next to me, and Sully had shifter hearing, so they both heard what she said just as well as I did. Did they say what shape it was in? If the body was fresh, I didn't want them near the scene in case the murderer was still in the area. Just that it looked like it had been attacked by a wild animal. He said he was packing a forty-five, so I told them to sit tight and you'd be there ASAP. Be careful. A scared kid with a gun may be just as apt to shoot you as anything else, and he was pretty keyed up. I imagine he was, I said. We'll be careful and give the siren a couple toots when we get close. I'll let you know when we're on scene. I hung up and pulled in a deep breath, looking at Sam and Sully as I did. Well, Sam said with a sigh as he pushed himself up from the stool. Looks like you called it. If that ain't trouble, I don't know what is. Sully held his finger up as he headed toward the kitchen. Wait a minute. You can't. And unless I miss my guess, you're not going to be stopping to eat again anytime soon. I shifted my weight from foot to foot, drumming my fingers on the back of the bar stool while we waited. It wasn't two minutes later that he came back with a paper bag in his hand. I put a couple sandwiches in there, along with some chips and pickles. He said as he poured our tea into to-go cups, topped them off, then handed them to us along with the bag. Eat on the way. I pulled some bills out of my pocket, but he waved me off. That doesn't count as a meal, so just take it and go. Good luck. Snorting, I turned to follow Sam, who was already halfway to the door. If I had any luck, I'd be sitting here eating a cheeseburger instead of bolting off to deal with a dead body, but thanks for the sandwiches. Lass, he said as I was almost to the door. Yeah, Sully? The concern on his face bothered me because he was usually unflappable. Take care. I don't like the feel of this. Something's off. The hairs on my nape stood up, and I nodded as I pushed out the door. It didn't feel right to me either. Will do. Let me know if you hear anything through the grapevine. Sully was the den leader of the region's bear pack, and they were one of the largest groups of shifters besides wolves in our area. Between his pack connections and the info he picked up at the pub, not much went on without his knowledge. We climbed into Sam's truck because it was closest, opting to ride together since the cabin was off the beaten path. The road to it was more path than anything because it was meant to be accessed via ATVs or on horseback. It would be all we could do to squeeze one truck and the coroner in, let alone two. Besides, we'd no doubt have much to talk about after we saw the body and combed over the scene. The trip took us a little over 30 minutes, mostly because once we left the main road, we had to find our way around downed logs. Once we pulled up in front of the cabin, we found a 20-something couple sitting on a moss-covered log as far away from the cabin as they could get without leaving the scene entirely. I'd put Sam's bubble light on the dashboard and turned it on. Ms. Ellen was right. The last thing we needed was to be shot at by a frightened, trigger-happy kid. We climbed out of the truck and made our way to the couple, a willowy girl with her blonde hair stuffed under a UGA ball cap and a tall guy who looked like a wrestler. Both were wide-eyed and pale, and I could see the remnants of their lunch splattered beside the porch. 
Thank God you're here, the girl exclaimed, jumping up from the log and rushing toward us. I couldn't help but notice she skirted the edge of the clearing, keeping as much distance between her and the cabin as possible. The guy followed her, his Adam's apple bobbing as he struggled not to heave again. He side-eyed the cabin, but kept quiet. Thanks for waiting. I know it wasn't easy, I said, the tears that shimmered in her eyes evidenced the girl's relief. It wasn't, but going back out into the woods, knowing whatever did that? She glanced toward the cabin. May still be out there was scarier than staying put and waiting on you. Sam had moved toward the boy, holding his hand out. I'm Deputy Cassidy, and this is Sheriff Sloan. Before we go in, can you tell us what happened? I'm Danny Pickering, and this is Charlene Tenney. He ran his fingers through his dark hair. I couldn't tell if it was meant to be spiked or if he'd just repeated the action so many times that it ended up that way. I pulled a deep breath in through my nose, searching for their scents. Both were human, and I didn't yet know if that was a good thing or not. Charlene nodded and shook our hands. We were hiking, looking for berries, and just enjoying the weather when we came across the cabin. We were about out of water, so we figured maybe there were some provisions inside. She turned a little green and glanced away into the trees behind me. It was common practice to leave basic provisions in cabins on the understanding that if you took something, you left something else. Danny picked up where she left off. When we went inside, we noticed a coppery smell so thick it turned our stomachs. Then she pointed to a couch that was tucked into a corner behind the kitchenette, and there he was. This time, Charlene couldn't hold back the tears, though she was putting forth a colossal effort. Her nose wrinkled, and her voice was thick when she spoke. He's mangled. It looks like wild animals ate part of him. Did you touch anything? Sam asked. They shook their heads. We didn't even make it much past the front door, Danny said, and his face turned a little red. I did get sick off the porch, though. Sorry about that. I waved him off. That's fine. Don't worry a bit about that. I had a stomach of seal and was a werewolf who'd eaten my share of downed game, but the first dead body I'd dealt with had been mangled, too. It had been all I could do to keep my cookies, so I understood. Sam dropped the tailgate on the truck and pulled a couple bottles of cold water out of the cooler he kept in his back floorboard. He handed them to them and motioned to the tailgate. Why don't you two have a seat while we go inside? The coroner will be here soon, and then we'll give you a ride back to town or home if you don't want to hike back. He glanced back and forth between them, waiting for an answer. Charlene shook her head and shuddered. Well, wait. I'm not walking in those woods. I couldn't blame her. Plus, we hadn't cleared them as suspects yet. Speaking of, I turned back to them. Did either of you recognize the victim? They shook their heads. To be honest, though, Charlene said, we didn't really get a good look at his face. It was so awful, we didn't get close enough before we ran back out. And his throats, well, his head's leaned pretty far back over the sofa. Well, goody. I turned back toward the cabin and squared my shoulders, trying to prepare myself for the worst. Chapter 3 It turned out it was a good thing I was mentally prepared for ugly, because that's what I got. The kids hadn't been exaggerating when they said he was ripped apart. I took a deep breath and forced myself to examine the body, trying to be as clinical as I could. That helped, but not by much. As soon as I stepped close enough to him to get a good look, I smelled his scent mingled in with everything else. Werewolf. I tried to examine the gashes on his body to determine what type of animal may have done it, but there were so many that it was impossible to discern any pattern or single paw swipes. Poor Sam was an army vet who'd been in Vietnam, and even he was a little green. Bracing myself, I closed my eyes and pulled in a deep breath. The coppery stench of blood filled my nostrils, but buried beneath that, 
I caught the slightest scent of bear and wolf, and something else I couldn't quite nail down. Perfume, I thought. I let the breath out, puffing my cheeks as I did so. The girl outside wasn't wearing any, so it hadn't come from her. This was not good. We had bears in Georgia, but we'd never had a wild bear attack before. I didn't see any reason for it to happen now, especially when there was no food involved. It wasn't cubbing season either, so a mama bear scenario was unlikely. As far as the wolf went, that was another can of worms altogether, one I hoped I didn't have to open. I glanced about, looking for any sort of clue that would help me understand what had happened while I told Sam what I'd smelled. He frowned, then pointed to the floor. Wide gashes marred the wood, but again, there were so many, it was hard to pick one set apart from another. I pulled a pair of latex gloves from my pocket and snapped them on before leaning down to examine them closer. They were fresh, and from what I could tell, spaced an inch or two apart, wide enough to be wolf claws, but probably not bear claws unless it was a little bear. My eyes wandered over the body again, and I noted a Glock strapped into a holster by his side. He was packing, I said. I saw that, Sam replied. I don't get why he didn't draw down on whatever attacked him. Something else was bothering me, too. I went back outside to the kids. Was the door closed when you got here? Latched? Or was it ajar? Danny furrowed his brow. It was shut and latched. I remember because it was stuck a little and I had to push to get it open. So, we had a bear or wolf that could pull doors closed behind itself. The only types of animals I could think of that could do that were of the shifter variety. This was looking worse and worse the more I learned. A commotion sounded from the porch and I turned my attention that way to see what was going on. Colleen, our M.E. and C.S.I. and her crew had arrived in the coroner's van. I was glad, because with the road being what it was, I'd been afraid they wouldn't be able to make it in. They turned a traditional three-point turn into a ten-point one due to the size of the space, but finally, they had it backed up to the porch. Colleen stepped out along with two of the guys from the emergency squad and pulled her black bag out behind her. What do we have? She asked. I shook my head. You don't want to know. That bad, huh? Worse, I said as she climbed the stairs and stepped onto the rickety porch. No way. It can't be worse than the attacks we had a couple months ago. That was true. Those were gruesome and, worse yet, public. I was thankful this guy was at least found out in the boondocks rather than near a public park like the other folks were. She pushed the door open and whistled. Wow, yeah, this is brutal. While she took out her tools and camera and got to work, I took another look around the cabin. Virtually nothing was out of place aside from a knocked-over lamp and the scratches. I frowned when I heard an ATV approaching. Like all small towns, word traveled fast when anything exciting happened, but I was surprised somebody was willing to travel this far out into the boonies just to get the scoop. Not that I'd put it past some of them, but it was more likely to be unsuspecting hunters or kids messing around with no idea what they were stumbling into. A Polaris Ranger pulled up in front of the porch and a scowling Fred Hutchinson climbed out of the driver's seat. His oldest boy, Tommy, hopped out of the passenger side. What's going on here? Fred demanded, stepping up onto the porch. He was a werewolf and built like a linebacker, so I hoped he didn't give me any trouble. I moved through the door and pulled it shut behind me. We need to talk, I said in a voice that brooked no argument. I was sheriff and his pack leader. A quick but subtle reminder now might make for smoother sailing. Darn tootin' we do, he said, trying to step around me. Tommy stayed near the ATV. He'd always been the calmest of Fred's crew. I stood firm in front of the door when Fred tried to push past me. So much for subtle. You can't go in there. It's a crime scene, 
Follow me, and I'll explain everything. There was a small picnic table in what passed for the yard, and I took a seat, reveling in the relative coolness of the shade. Tommy sat down, but Fred didn't. Instead, he turned back toward the cabin. It's my property, and I have a right to go in. No, you don't. It's a crime scene, which means I have jurisdiction over it right now. I replied, then put a little compulsion into my voice when he took a couple steps toward the cabin. Sit down, Fred. I hated to do that, and he hated having it done, but he couldn't disobey. I was his pack leader. He took a seat across from me. A couple of hikers found a body in there, I said. His eyes snapped to mine, and his posture changed from a pouting slouch to rigid attention. What do you mean they found a body? Somebody had a heart attack or something? He glowered. I knew I should have fenced this place off. I took a deep breath and released it. No, it wasn't a heart attack. He was murdered. I leaned in closer. I didn't want to share too much information, but he catched the sense the second we cleared the scene and he went in anyway. He was a wolf, and it looks like it was a shifter who did it. His eyes narrowed. What kind of shifter? I'm not sure, I said, frustrated. The smell of blood muddied everything else. I got a whiff of bear and wolf. Well, the wolf scent could be from us. Tommy pointed to the remains of a fire in the fire pit in the middle of the open space. We were just up here last weekend. Did you recognize it? I shook my head. It was so faint, all I can say for sure is it was the second wolf. It may even be a regular wild one. I picked at a loose splinter in the table as Fred leaned forward and put his head in his hands. How was he killed? Do you know who he is? He was mauled, I said, and no, I don't know him. All I know is he was one of us. Colleen stepped out onto the porch and called to me. Rising from the table, I held a finger up to the men. Excuse me for just a second. They nodded, and I headed toward where Colleen was standing on the porch. As I approached, I muttered a muffling spell so that Fred and Tommy, with their wolf hearing, wouldn't be able to eavesdrop. What's up? I asked, noting her furrowed brow. There was more than one killer, I think. How can you tell? He's a mess. Yeah, he is. But there are a couple bites on his arm that are way too small to have been made by the same animal that mauled him. Great, I said, my shoulders sagging. Is there any good news? She shrugged. He didn't suffer much. Despite how it looks, the bite to the neck he took looks to be the killing blow. There's so little blood on the other wounds that unless I miss my guess, they went for his throat first. Oh, and we have his ID. His name was Daryl Beauchamp. My stomach dropped to my toes. I didn't know him directly, but I'd heard of him. He was the second in command of the New Orleans pack. My mom and dad, the alpha couple who led the southeast region, had been in negotiations with them for the last six months. They were the only group refusing to form a coalition that would unite shifters of all species under the same umbrella of laws. Their reason? They didn't want to lose the exclusive right to determine the fate of somebody who committed a crime against their pack specifically. And yet my mother had worn them down with logic and they'd finally given in, albeit begrudgingly. My folks and the rest of the council were scheduled to meet with their alpha and the man currently taking a permanent nap inside the cabin the following week to sign the papers. That feeling of impending doom had settled back on my shoulders, twice as heavy as before. I was afraid we hadn't even begun to see trouble yet. Chapter 4 Tommy was still sitting at the table, but Fred was pacing beside it when I released the muffling spell and Colleen went back inside. I wanted to look for tracks, but I sucked at that. Fred, on the other hand, did not, and he was about to fidget clean out of his own skin. The man needed something to do. I weighed my options. Fred was a straight shooter and had helped us out on a couple other occasions, 
and even though the body was found on his land, I'd have bet my last nickel he didn't have anything to do with the murder. It just wasn't how he was. So, I needed help, and he needed something to do. I'd forgotten all about the kids until Charlene called to me across the clearing. How much longer is it going to be? I have to work tonight. Glancing at Tommy, then at the Polaris, which would seat three people just fine, I turned to him and smiled. Oh no, he said, shaking his head. I'm not going anywhere. He set his jaw in that stubborn way only a late teens kid can. Please, I said. Sam and I are going to be here for at least another hour, and I need your dad's help. Just run them down to their car, wherever they left it, and then you can come right back. With any luck, we'd have things mostly wrapped up by then. Fred jerked his chin toward the ATV. Do as the sheriff says, but come straight back here. I ain't got no other ride home. Scowling, Tommy motioned for Charlene and Danny to follow him. While they got situated and left, I perused the immediate area. I figured the odds of finding any tracks or clues right around the cabin were slim because the grass was fairly high and we'd been tromping through it. The grass thinned at the tree line, so I figured we'd have a decent shot there, assuming the murderer, or victim, came in on foot. Hey, I said, walking over to Fred and motioning for Sam to join us. We need to look for tracks. Try to figure out where they came in from, or at least what they were. Fred, a lifelong hunter and amazing tracker, was more than eager to help if for no other reason than to have something to do. Plus, as a shifter, he'd also be able to use his nose. He gave a curt nod. Sam took over, breaking the area off into sections so we wouldn't walk over each other, even though there were only three of us. His military training served us well in situations like this, which was only one of the million reasons I was glad to have him. Even if he did shove the little old complaining ladies off on me every chance he got. Okay, he said, looking back and forth between Fred and me. If you find anything, just call out. Don't touch it. We need pictures of it to put with the rest of the evidence for Colleen. We branched out, each to our own areas. I swept back and forth in three-foot sections, looking for any sign that somebody'd passed through there. I found a couple broken branches and some deer tracks, but that was about it. Over here, Fred called. I made a mental note of where I'd left off, then headed in his direction, doing my best to pay attention to where I was walking. He was kneeling, examining something on the ground. Looky here, he said as soon as Sam and I made it to him. I knelt down to get a closer look. My knowledge of tracks was limited, but even I recognized it. Or I was almost sure I did. That's a huge black bear, Sam exclaimed, taking off his hat, running his hand through his salt and pepper hair, then jamming it back on again. Fred nodded. One of the biggest I've seen. Not the biggest, but close. He had a good finger on the pulse of the shifter community, and a couple of his hunting buddies were bear shifters. Do you recognize it? He shook his head, then furrowed his brow and took two steps forward. That's odd. I followed him, then realized what he was pointing out. There was another set of prints, but these were rear, and the left one was missing a toe. So we're looking for a man missing a toe, Sam said. Fred lifted a shoulder, then stood up and stretched his back. I'd say so. There's no way to know this wasn't just a regular old black bear passing through, but that would be a huge coincidence. And I didn't believe in coincidences. Not when there was a dead man shredded up in a hunting cabin 40 feet from the track. I followed the set of tracks with my eyes, looking for signs of a smaller creature that might have been with it. I didn't see any. Did either of you see any signs of a smaller animal? Dog or wolf, maybe? Both men shook their heads, and Sam and I went back to our areas to finish scouting. Fred followed the tracks until they dead-ended in a stream that ran behind the cabin. 
None of us turned anything else up, and we decided to call it a day. Kaleem went back in to finish up after telling me there was nothing I could do there. I'll call you if I find anything. I want to take a look around the perimeter of the cabin and see if I can find anything. It's possible the victim got a swipe or two in before they got him. It just doesn't make sense to me why they mangled him like that when he was already essentially dead. Overkill or bloodlust. Maybe whoever it was just lost control. She was, by necessity, in on our secret, so I was able to speak freely. Werewolves, or shifters in general, don't lose control. At least not any more than any other person. We maintain human cognizance, though our instincts are heightened. If this is a case of overkill, or bloodlust, as you put it, it's from a human emotion. True, she said, but we don't know for sure yet what did this. It could have been a wild animal attack. I shook my head. Not unless bears or wolves have learned to open and close doors. She raised a brow. It's not unheard of, you know. Bears have been known to do that. That was true, but it just didn't feel right in this situation. I said as much. Well, all I can do is tell you what the scene tells me. And honestly, it ain't saying much. Other than the claw marks on the floor, I haven't found anything other than a ton of wolf hair. I groaned. I hadn't thought of that. Even if the killer did leave behind a hair or some other evidence, picking it out of the ones that were supposed to be there would be virtually impossible. It would be like picking the odd feather out of an entire mattress full of different colored feathers. The family was here last weekend and had friends with them. Great. She replied, running a hand over her face. Then let's hope we find something outside. I'd marked the spot where we'd found the bear tracks and pointed it out to her. Fred's one of the best trackers I've ever known. He tried to follow the trail, but it dead-ended at the creek. She nodded. I'll have my team do the rounds. I'll let you know if anything new comes up in here. Thanking her, I moved toward the truck where Sam was waiting. I needed to call my mother, but if I had the choice between doing that and stabbing a fork in my eye, I'd probably choose the fork. I'd been dodging her for a couple days because, lately, she'd been hassling me about my relationship with Alex, a fellow witch-werewolf hybrid. We'd met during a murder investigation, another story altogether, and it really hit it off. He was now living in Castle's Bluff, and we were seeing each other. But for some reason, my mother seemed to think we weren't moving fast enough. Relationships were hard enough when both people were nine-to-fivers. But we weren't. We both had demanding jobs that didn't allow for a whole lot of free time, and it didn't help that he was out of town frequently. Between me being the sheriff as well as the local pack leader and him being a pack liaison for the region, there were some weeks when we didn't even see each other. Like this week. He was up in North Carolina on pack business, and now it looked like I was going to be elbow deep in crap with a murder investigation. With any luck, I'd get to the bottom of that soon, though. If not, my mother's hard-laid plans were about to go up in smoke, and somehow, it'd be my fault. Chapter 5 While Colleen and her crew finished up inside and moved the body to the van, we looked for more tracks, but didn't have any luck. We found a couple sets of four-wheeler tracks, but they were generic. Nothing out of the ordinary, and half the county owned at least one, so that was a path to nowhere. They were loading the body up when Tommy got back, and I thought he was going to break his neck trying to get a look at the body. Teenage boys. The only thing was, if he'd actually seen it, he would have wished he hadn't. I sure did. Fred climbed behind the wheel of the Polaris, and Tommy got in beside him. We'll do some checking around. I haven't seen any bears around lately, at least none I don't know, and it won't be hard to pick that track out if I see it again. I'm guessing you're going to talk to Sully? I nodded. 
He's my next stop. Good, he said. Sam, who'd been helping the crew gather up equipment and load up, made his way over to us, wiping his brow on his sleeve. When was the last time anybody besides you and your crew stayed here? He asked. Me and some of my friends stayed here weekend before last, Tommy said. Before that, nobody's used it for the last couple months or so as far as we know, but hikers stop in that we don't know about. That may sound strange, but as shifters, we didn't hold quite the same views on land ownership as humans did. People think wolves and bears and the like are territorial, but when it came right down to it, no creature on earth was more itchy about sharing what they owned than regular old people. Unless folks had livestock, most of us just left the land open for all. After all, bears and wolves need room. The news was discouraging because it meant all the prints that Colleen probably pulled were worthless unless we found a suspect. That's assuming she could even sort through them all. And one of the last things she told us as she left was that the knob had been wiped clean. That left us with the tracks. So are we free to go back in? Fred asked. I pulled in a deep breath, thinking, and glanced at Sam. He'd been the last to talk to Colleen. If you wouldn't mind giving us a couple days just in case, that would be great, Sam said. Besides, it's not going to be pretty in there, especially in this heat. We'll send somebody out to clean it up for you. Is there a lock on the door? There's a place for a padlock, Fred said. But I don't have a lock with me. Sam scratched his whiskers. I think I have one in my toolbox. Fred motioned toward the cabin. Be my guest then. Unless I miss my guess, we'll have kids up here wanting to get a look at the place, and it's probably just as well if they can't. The window's locked from the inside. Sam went to his truck and started rummaging through his toolbox, and something popped into my head. I want to take another look inside before we go, I said, heading back to the cabin. Tommy and Fred followed, but I held up my hand. Let me see how bad it is before y'all come in, okay? I poked my head inside, doing my best to breathe through my mouth. It was surprisingly clean. The old love seat would have to go, but aside from a few dark stains on the floor, there wasn't much sign of what had happened there. Giving them a nod, I said. Just don't touch anything, all right? They muttered in agreement and followed me in. Fred had been a wolf long enough to know to breathe through his mouth, but Tommy wasn't that experienced. He was only a step in before he turned green from the coppery smell and walked back to the porch. I motioned Fred forward and pointed at the claw marks. Those consistent with bear? He bent down closer and examined them, furrowing his brow. Maybe, but if so... They're not from the one who made those tracks out there. Space between them isn't wide enough. He pointed to the front of the marks, then followed them with his fingers as they led back. You found the body on the love seat, I assume? I nodded. These are almost like whatever animal made them was being pulled backward. Is it possible the victim made them, then changed back to human once he was dead? I hadn't thought to ask Colleen whether the guy had claw marks on his back as well as his front. Fred rubbed the back of his neck. Maybe. They're wide for a wolf, though. All I can tell you for sure was something was drugged backwards and was digging in to stay put. And that whoever it was wasn't the same creature who made the tracks we found outside. Another scenario occurred to me. What if our guy was pushing his attacker backward? He shook his head. I guess that could be it, but I doubt it. They wouldn't be that consistent. Sighing, I turned back toward the door, then at the last minute pulled my phone out and took a picture of the claw marks as well as a few more of the surroundings. Colleen would have crime scene pics ready in a couple of hours, but something wasn't sitting right with me. I wanted a chance to look the scene over without the smell, and preferably with a cold beer in front of me, to see if I could figure out what it was. 
Sam clomped up the steps and leaned against the door frame, taking the room in again one last time himself. He held up a heavy padlock with two keys attached to it with a zip tie. Found it. Fred and I stepped out and Sam pulled the door shut behind us, then closed the latch over the hook and snapped the padlock into place. He turned to Fred. You want one of these keys? I'm good. Fred replied. Just let me know when it's open again. We ain't got any plans to use it in the near future. Tommy, who'd been sitting on the edge of the porch, wrinkled his nose. Far as I'm concerned, we should just burn it down. We ain't gonna get all that blood out of those wood planks, and it'd be creepy to be in there at night. Fred rolled his eyes at him. You're a wolf and scared of ghosts? Tommy motioned toward the doorway as he pushed off the porch. That guy was a wolf, and it don't look like it did him much good. He made a good point. Speaking of the guy being a wolf, I couldn't put off a call to my mom much longer, but first I was going to go back to Sully's, have a sit-down with him to see if he knew any bears missing toes, and have a cheeseburger and a beer, or three. Sam shook hands with Fred and Tommy, and the Hutchinson men were long gone before we even got the truck turned around. What do you think? Sam asked, turning to me. I think shit's about to hit the fan, I said, not mincing words. And boy, was I right. Chapter 6 on the drive back to town, Sam and I reviewed the case, or at least what little we knew about it. After that, I decided I couldn't put off the call to my mom any longer. If she heard about it from somebody else, my goose would be cooked. When I dialed, part of me hoped I got her voicemail, but the realistic part of me realized that would just be putting off the inevitable. She answered on the second ring. Hello, darling. How are you? At least this time, I knew she wasn't going to grill me about Alex since he was up there. Hi, Mom, I said. I, so I've had a little time to talk to Alex, she said, cutting me off. I pulled in a deep breath. I should have known. He says you two are getting along like peas and carrots. I know it sounds weird, but I preferred to talk to my mother about the murder rather than my love life. We are. I said, but that's not why I called. I have some news that's not good in any way you slice it. Pack news. Oh? Her voice became all business. When it came to the pack, she took her role as half of the alpha couple seriously. It came before idle chit-chat and motherly nosiness hands down. What's wrong? I closed my eyes dreading delivering what could be a death blow to the merger she'd put her all into for the past two years. We've had a murder down here. I decided to just cut straight to the chase. It's Daryl Beauchamp. A pregnant pause filled the airspace between us for the span of a couple heartbeats. Then, in her typical fashion, she got down to brass tacks. I don't have to tell you what this means for the pack. She said, her voice deadly serious. I've been working on this coalition for the better part of two years. At least tell me you know who did it and that it was a human. She was working on striking a similar deal with the vampires and the witches were almost a given. They'd been all for standardizing the paranormal legal system for years. A human killer was the best possible outcome from a political standpoint. I fidgeted even though she couldn't see me. I didn't want to be the one to tell her all her hard work was swirling the drain, but I didn't have a choice. No, I haven't solved it, and from the looks of it, it was a bear shifter, and they may not have been working alone. Colleen says there were smaller bites on his arm that weren't consistent with the rest of them, and I caught a whiff of a wolf, though that could have just been because the owners are wolves. No, no, no she said, and I could see her wagging her fingers and pacing in my mind's eye. You have to figure this out before the end of the week. If they end up backing out, several other clans and packs will follow. 
They're twitchy about uniting, even though the new council will have elected representatives from each region. Personally, I didn't see what the big deal was. Regardless of species, most of our laws were the same, with the exception of the vampires. The disconnect came when one species committed a crime against another, because then the two different legal entities were involved. This new system would bridge that gap, but little else would change in either theory or in function. So do you want to handle the New Orleans Alpha, or do you want me to? I asked, silently begging the universe for a break. I had enough on my plate. She sighed. Not that I don't think you could handle it, but I want you to focus on finding whoever did it. I'll deal with the NOLA pack and pray the murder wasn't politically motivated. Never in my life had I wished for a garden variety murder, if there was such a thing, but I did then. Mom was right on this, and it would benefit all of us especially those of us who were responsible for enforcing the law. Okay, then. Sam and I are on it, and I'll keep you posted. Please do, she said. And Cordelia? Yes, Mom? Do your thing, no matter what. I'm sending Alex back early to help. He's friends with Barnaby Dupre, the New Orleans Alpha, so maybe he can buy us a little leeway. Lord, I hoped so. They were a hot-headed bunch, and the last thing I wanted was for them to descend on me like, well, a pack of wolves while I was trying to figure out who'd killed somebody in my county. I took my job seriously, and nobody was more pissed about it than I was. I'd had a nagging feeling since we found out who he was, and the reason for it popped into my head. Find out what he was doing down here, please. He was a long way from home and that cabin's out in the boondocks. I can't imagine he would have known about it on his own. By then, we'd reached Sully's, and as Sam swung the truck in, I was glad Sully and I had the relationship we did. He wasn't just the den leader. He was well-respected by his people, so it would make them feel better to have him central to the investigation. Your mom's right, as bad as I hate to say it, Sam said as he pulled into a spot and shut the truck off. He and my mother went way back, but they didn't always see eye to eye. They liked each other just fine, but as two strong-willed people, they butted heads sometimes. My dad, on the other hand, was one of his best friends. How so? I asked. Some of the folks around here aren't keen on this coalition. I was at the hook the other night and overheard rocks, the vampire owner and bartender, talking to Chuck McKnight about it. Apparently, the Bobcats are running lukewarm on the whole thing, and some of the Badgers are too. Most of them see it as a good thing, but there's a small but significant portion dead set against it. This could be the fuse that sets off the keg, depending on how we handle it. The Rusty Hook was the local dive bar, and though I loved rocks to pieces, he gossiped worse than little old church ladies at a Sunday social. Then it's a good thing that it's her problem for now, and not mine, I said. We have a murder to solve, and the rest will have to come out in the wash. Chapter 7 As always, Sully's was cool and dim and the smells of frying meat and grilled onions filled my nose. I breathed it in, and my stomach rumbled. The sandwich he'd packed for us had been great, but it had been hours ago. He greeted us with a smile that faded when he saw our expressions. This time, he didn't ask. He just poured me a pint of my regular beer and popped the cap off a bottle of Miller Lite for Sam. I climbed onto my stool and took a long pull from my glass, relishing the cold, hoppy brew as it hit my tongue and slid down my throat. Sam did the same, letting out a sigh of appreciation. Not only were we emotionally spent, but we had also been on our feet and out in the heat for the better part of five hours. It was good to sit down in the A.C. Cool weather couldn't come fast enough as far as I was concerned. Sully examined us as he wiped down the bar. Was it that bad? You look spent, the both of you. 
Worse, Sam said, grabbing a handful of Chex Mix from a bowl on the bar. I shuddered, as always, picturing the plethora of germs he was popping into his mouth, along with the salty snack. He noticed, and being the smart aleck he is, offered me some, then made a big deal of popping another handful into his mouth. Thanks anyway, I said, scrunching my nose. I'll just go straight to the source and lick the toilet handle. He grinned, then Sully brought us crashing back to reality. So what happened? He asked. I cleared my throat and set my beer down, focusing on centering it on the coaster. Nothing good. We need to talk. There were several other people in the place, and some of them were shifters. In private. Sounds serious. He replied, glancing around. When he caught sight of his waitress, Kellyanne, he called her over and asked her to cover for him for a minute. Let's go to my office, he said, turning toward the kitchen and motioning for us to follow him. Al, his line cook, was flipping burgers, and the smell about made my stomach turn inside out and eat itself. He smiled at me when I gazed longingly at the ginormous patties frying on the griddle. I'll have y'all specials ready when you come out. They're already on the grill. I smiled at him, grateful he knew me so well. Sully led us down a short hall and into a surprisingly neat office, decorated with pictures of his family and a lone dartboard, currently holding a picture of a politician. That made me grin. The rule numero uno in a bar was no politics or religion. He wasn't shy about voicing his opinions any other time. He took a seat in a well-worn office chair behind his desk, and Sam and I took the two facing him. So what's all the fuss about? He asked, an expectant look on his face. Did you find out who he was? Any idea who did it? Yeah, I said. It was Daryl Bouchamp. I could tell by the, oh crap, expression on his face that he knew who I was talking about. That's not good, lass, he said. This could blow the whole shebang. I know. Boy, did I know. I took a deep breath before I told him the bad part. And that's not all. I caught a whiff of bear inside, and there were a couple sets of huge bear tracks outside in the mud. I paused, waiting for him to absorb that. That doesn't necessarily mean a bear killed him, he said, though the resigned look on his face made it clear he was at least entertaining the possibility. You're right, Sam said. The tracks were clear. And it rained the night before last, so it was made after that. And the left rear paw was missing a toe. I watched Sully's face carefully for any flicker of recognition, but all he expressed was thoughtfulness. I don't know anybody missing a toe, he said. But I'll ask around. That's something somebody would know about, seeing as how most of us go barefoot when we meet up to change. And he was huge. I reminded him. Yeah, he said. But that doesn't necessarily mean he's that large as a man. Usually, but not always. Still, I'll start investigating on my end. Hopefully, we can get this cleared up before the wolves from Nola back out of the deal and drag those who aren't so keen with them. You and me both, I said. Sam pushed up from the chair. We'll keep you posted and we'd appreciate it if you'd do the same. Of course, Sully said, rising. This isn't just a bear thing or a wolf thing. The consequences are way beyond that. Good, I said. Then about that cheeseburger. As promised, Al had our favorites ready when we made it back to our seats, and I dug in. The juicy goodness of it hit the spot after such a crappy day and the beer went with it perfectly. I texted Colleen to see if she'd learned anything, but she was still trying to put the pieces back together, so to speak, and didn't have anything new for us. I was a little surprised I hadn't heard from the Bouchamp family, but Mom had said she'd take care of it. We didn't always see eye to eye, but she always came through when it mattered, and this definitely counted. 
Since there was nothing we could do for the time being, Sam and I decided to call it a day. I was supposed to have a magic lesson, but I just didn't have it in me to focus on moving rocks with my mind or building a defensive bubble to keep people out of my head, so I called and canceled. Chapter 8 When I pulled into the driveway of the house I shared with my best friend, a centuries-old vampire named Katerina Bellarossi, I was tickled to see Alex's silver beamer sitting there. Mom had said she was sending him back early, but I was surprised he'd gotten there in the time it took me to eat a cheeseburger. He was sitting on the porch swing smiling at me, those irresistible dimples that only appeared when he was genuinely smiling, out in full force. Hey, beautiful, he said, pulling me into a hug. I've missed you. I hugged him back, then gave him a quick kiss. I've missed you too, though I hear you had my mom reminding you of me. He laughed and kissed me on the forehead. She did everything except ask me when I was going to propose, and the only reason it didn't get that far was because your dad shut her down by inviting her to dinner. And that's why they're the perfect couple. His superpower is being the only man on the planet who can manage my mom with food and shiny things. I could feel the goofy grin on my face, brought on by his unexpected appearance, but couldn't seem to do anything about it. How did you get here so fast? I thought you were in Charlotte. He shook his head, pulling me onto his lap on the swing. Nope. I've been in Atlanta for the last couple days helping out the regional pack leader there. We finished up a day early, and I was already on my way home when your mom called. My smile vanished. Yeah, about that. A bundle of black and white fur launched herself onto the swing, pushing her head underneath Alex's free hand. A pair of emerald eyes glinted up at me as the shiny black nose twitched. You had a cheeseburger without me. My arctic fox familiar, Chaos, glared at me. Guilty, I said. But I did bring you one back. I opened the to-go bag Sully'd given me on the porch floor and popped open the lid, cringing in anticipation of her response a little as I did. She poked around in the box. Broccoli? She wrinkled her nose. Why would you bring me broccoli? And where's the bun and my fries? Broccoli's good for you, and the bun is just empty carbs. What I didn't tell her was that her recent eating habits had led to several extra pounds. It was to the point that she was going to need her own couch if she grew any more. She tilted her head and gave me the side eye. Did yours have a bun? Uh, yeah. I didn't want to hurt her feelings, but I didn't want to lie to her either. I still had a mad cheese to yours, though, so give me some credit. She glared at me, then ate her burger as Alex and I rocked and decompressed. He put his hand on the back of my neck and massaged my nape while I closed my eyes and pretended we didn't have a guy with post-mortem potential to destroy a pact that would improve the lives of thousands of people and stabilize an impractical justice system. I couldn't get it out of my head, though. Do you have a bad feeling about this murder? I do, he replied. There's a lot at stake, and your mom's already making preliminary gestures toward pulling the vampires under the umbrella eventually. How we handle this will have a huge impact on that. He was right. Vampires had their own rules, and they were much harsher than any other species. The worst part about their system was that once their archaic council, made up mostly of people more than a thousand years old, made a decision... They didn't always share the verdict. Sometimes the offender just disappeared, never to be seen again. Convincing them to work with us, even a little, would be a big deal. So tell me what you have so far, he said. I did, finishing with. What if somebody killed him just to sabotage the coalition? Chaos shook her head. You may be thinking about this on too grand a scale. What do you mean? I asked. Alex gave the swing a push with his foot. She means there are more logical motives to kill him, and taking him out isn't a guarantee that the treaty won't go through. 
Why was he even here? That's a good question, Chaos agreed, wiping her whiskers with her paws. I asked the same thing, I said. Mom wants to deal with them, but I expect I'll be getting a call anyway. If I don't hear back from her before I do, that'll be my first question. The screen door squeaked open and Kat stuck her head out, her head wrapped in a towel. I thought I heard you guys out here, she said, squinting even though the porch was shaded. She was old enough that the sun wouldn't melt her face off, but it still wasn't her best friend. She slept through most of the day, though that suited her because she was a bartender at the hook. Most nights she didn't get home until 4 a.m. anyway. Morning, I said as she yawned. I thought you were off tonight. I thought I was, too. The other bartender called and asked me to switch tonight for tomorrow, and it's not like I had anything better to do. I huffed a breath out my nose. I wish I could say that. She drew her brows together. What did I miss today? When I went to bed, all was as idyllically boring as always. Yeah, well... That went right out the window when somebody up and tore Daryl Beauchamp to shreds in Fred Hutchinson's hunting cabin. Her brows shot up. Say what now? I explained it to her. She pressed her lips together. Tall, dark hair, 35-ish, had that slow, sexy bayou drawl. Tall with dark hair and 35-ish, I can testify to, he wasn't doing much speaking when I met him this morning. Alex smiled at my gallows humor. I think it's safe to say he would have if you'd run across him a day earlier. He turned to Kat. Why do you ask? He was at the hook last night, she said. Seemed upset about something. Then a man joined him and they had words. He finished his beer and left. That was early. Probably around 9.30, 10? And you didn't know that man? I asked. Nope, she said. He didn't even have a beer. Just came in looking like trouble. Gave your guy a piece of his mind and left. I was mixing a couple drinks and by the time I was done, he was gone. And how did Daryl, if that's who it was, react? Chaos asked. Like a kid who'd had his favorite toy taken, he scowled a little, then downed his beer, did a shot of tequila, and left. Tipped well. Alex scratched his jaw. Did the other guy look like an angry husband type? Cat didn't even have to think about it. Not even a little. If I had to guess, he was a friend. Or maybe a family member. They were familiar with each other, but it wasn't hostile. More like a dressing down. Plus, the guy was a lot older than he was. He looked to be in his 50s, maybe even early 60s. First time I'd ever laid eyes on either of them. I picked up the phone to call my mother. I needed to talk to Barnaby Dupre myself. I had to know why Daryl was here and if he had any relations or friends in the area. I realized the need for a light touch, but there wasn't time for that. Plus, as I saw it, the best way to stay in his, and his packs, good graces was transparency. Chapter 9 Mom picked up on the first ring and agreed with me after I explained the situation. I was hoping to be able to help take some of the load off you, she said. But I think you're right. I've tried to call him several times, but he's not picking up. Since I have no second-in-command to contact, I thought it best to wait to speak directly to him. After assuring her I'd keep her apprised, we disconnected. You know, Chaos said, most murders are committed for love, money, or revenge, and the latter is usually a result of an incident involving the first two. I'd suggest asking about his love life and his finances before anything else. I was already a step ahead of her, but she was right. I was leaning more toward money after what Kat had told me, but it wasn't going to disqualify love or hate either. People killed for a plethora of reasons, 
and we didn't have enough information to even guess at that point. Taking a deep breath, I dialed the number Alex read off to me. He'd worked with Barnaby on a professional level and had even gone to visit and go crabbing a few times, though it had been a few years. He suggested he make the call, but I figured it was better to keep the chain of command simple. It wasn't always easy being a female sheriff and pack leader, so I preferred to be the one to deal with him from the get-go. A man with the exact accent Kat had just described answered. Hello, I said, trying to sound businesslike and friendly at the same time. This is Corey Sloan, Sheriff of Castle's Bluff and Alpha of the Southwest Georgia Pack. Is this Barnaby Dupre? Ah, Ms. Sloan, I've heard good things about you, but have never had the pleasure. Yes, this is Barnaby Dupre. I paused, not sure how to deliver the information. I was about to dive into unknown waters, though Alex had assured me the man was easygoing and reasonable. I wasn't so sure this was an occasion where even the most even-tempered of men would be able to hold it together. I'm afraid this isn't going to be quite the pleasurable first conversation I'd like for it to be, Mr. Dupre. I have some bad news, and I'm sorry to be the one to deliver it. I went on to explain what had happened, and silence filled the line before he gave a deep, guttural growl. Who did it? He asked in a voice as cold as ice, and I was glad I wasn't the murderer. I don't know yet, but I'm using all my resources to find out. In addition to having an incredible CSI, I'm also working with the local bear alpha. He has a lot of contacts, and I'm hoping he comes up with some useful information. I also have full access to my pack's best if I need it, of course. No offense, Ms. Sloan, but I'm familiar with small-town investigation techniques, and I think you need more help than you have. Not that I don't think you can do the job, or that your family doesn't have the resources, but I'd rather have one of my people there, too. For me, that was a worst-case scenario, and I tried to head him off before he could barrel down that trail. Unfortunately, he wasn't to be dissuaded. Finally, in the interest of politics, I gave in. I understand your need to have one of your own people in here to be hands-on, I told him. Who should I expect? He was quiet for a moment. I have a few people in mind, Give me an hour to make a decision, and I'll get back to you. Fair enough, I said, then added. I hope this doesn't impact your decision to join the coalition. It's a step in the right direction, and we'll have a reach beyond just one person. He sighed. Now's not the time for politics, Ms. Sloan, though I understand it's probably the only reason you've agreed so readily to allow one of my people to work with you. Daryl wasn't just my second in command. He was my friend. First and foremost, my priority is to find whoever killed him and bring him to justice. As is mine, I replied. Do you have any idea what he was doing down here? He sounded tired when he answered. I do but I need to follow up on that before I share it with you. Innocent people may be involved, and I don't want to drag them into it unless need be. I'll check into that and give you more information when I call you back to let you know who to expect. Okay, I said. But remember, the more information I have, the more able I'll be to bring Mr. Bouchamp's murderer to justice. An interest in word choice given our current state of affairs. I'll be interested to see what your idea of justice is, he said. Though I didn't detect anything off about the statement, I did know it would play a tremendous part in his decision to move forward with the treaty. After all, I was the daughter to the Alpha who was heading the whole shebang, and an Alpha in my own right who would be working within the system. My justice is simple. I said. Murderers don't go unpunished, but it also depends on why he was killed. I don't just want to know who, I need to know why to make sure that justice is truly served. It's good to hear you say that, but rest assured, 
if your idea of justice doesn't align with mine, we're going to have a problem. I'm sure that won't be the case, I said, praying to every possible deity out there that I was right. Then I'll talk to you in an hour, he said before disconnecting. Well, Alex said once I made sure the call was disconnected. That could have gone better, but it could have gone much, much worse. Yeah, I said, my shoulders sagging. Now we just have to hope that once we find who did it, the motive is cut and dried. I'd prefer not to have to make a judgment call from my seat on the powder keg. Look at it this way, Chaos said from where she was stuffed between Alex and me on the swing. This could strengthen his resolution to join the coalition. Yeah, I said. Or it could be the straw that makes him pull out of it, too. It was only the fate of the most momentous step-forward supernatural creatures had taken in eons that depended on my capabilities as a cop and pack leader. No pressure there at all. Chapter 10 Alex and I spent the next hour getting me up to speed. Since he had more knowledge of the NOLA pack than I did, he gave me a rundown of the players and those connected to them. He'd also met Daryl Bouchamp, though that had been several years ago. According to him, the man had been affable and easy to get along with, though he took his pack duties seriously. As far as Alex knew, he'd just gotten married, his parents were still alive, and he was the perfect right-hand man for Dupre because he considered the human element and tended to follow his gut, whereas his alpha tended to be clinical and analytical, making decisions based solely on facts and logic. I'd already experienced that firsthand. They balanced each other well. So did he lean too far toward making the decisions personal? Or was he more middle of the road? I asked. If he made a bad call because he went too far that direction, or made a call that showed favoritism, it could have been a motive for murder. Alex thought for a minute. I don't know. All in all, he was considered fair. I've never heard that he played favorites or had any of his decisions questioned. Of course, they tend to be isolationists, so it could just be that it didn't get out, we shouldn't cross it off the list just yet. I felt a little better when my phone rang because I had a better handle on the big picture. Mr. Dupre, have you made any headway into why Mr. Bouchamp may have been down here? I have, he said, his voice thick with that heavy drawl so unique to New Orleans. And there are two possibilities. I had no idea he was going, so your phone call was out of the blue to me. And please, call me Barnaby. I wish I hadn't had to make it, Barnaby, I said. That's never a call I want to make, regardless of who it is. But yet you had to. He took a deep breath and let it out. I just let his parents know. Needless to say, they're devastated and wanted to send his brother there to be our representative. I didn't think that was a good idea. I need somebody there who can be objective and is willing to work with you to solve this. With that in mind, Selena Moreau will be there tomorrow. That was the earliest flight I could get. She's next in line behind Daryl, so she's the logical choice. Are you sure that's a good idea? I asked. I think as next in line, she had motive. That would be true had she known, but she did not. Had I followed tradition, she wouldn't have been in the running. However, I didn't. I chose her because she has characteristics similar to Daryl's. I'm well aware of my shortcomings and believe balance is an absolute must. Then I'll expect her. You said you had some idea of why you may have been here? He paused for a minute, and I got the feeling he was trying to decide how much to tell me. Remember, Barnaby, the more I know, the better my chances of solving this quickly. I'm aware. It's just that it's tricky because it's hearsay. Another pause. 
Rumor has it that he was meeting with a colleague who'd moved to your region several years ago. We received word this man was going to be disruptive to the treaty process. He's quite old school. I thought back to the man Cat had seen Bouchamp talking to at the bar. And the man's name? Andre Glapian. He's been involved in PAC politics for years, but dropped out of the whole thing when his wife died. He was raised with Daryl's father, and they stayed friends until Daryl's dad passed last year. That's when he moved to your region. Is this man in his mid-fifties or so? Now that he'd said the name, I remembered him. He'd come in to let me know he'd moved to the region, as all wolves were required to do. He is? Barnaby said, a question in his voice. I met him when he checked in, and I believe he spoke with Daryl the night he was killed. Were they still on good terms? The barmaid said the encounter was brief but unpleasant. She said Andre, if it was indeed Andre, was angry. The relationship with Daryl's father certainly explained why Cat interpreted their interaction as a dressing down. He likely had fatherly feelings toward Daryl. As far as I know, they were on good terms, and Andre's a good man. Like many in his generation, he doesn't deal well with change. Daryl was hoping to help him see the positives. Since we were leaning heavily toward entering the treaty, I'd prefer my PAC members to see the benefits rather than the pitfalls. I didn't see any pitfalls, as he called them, but obviously there was a sector that did. If Barnaby was going out of his way to smooth the way with his pack, that was a good sign, though. I'd done the same with the less enthusiastic in my region, and so had Mom and Dad. You said there were a couple reasons why he may have come down here, I reminded him. He paused even longer this time before responding. This is the hearsay part. I'm still not sure I should share it because of that, but in the interest of a quick resolution, I will. Daryl's sister met a man from your region at a conference in Savannah a few months back, and he was convinced they were carrying on a long-distance relationship. He wasn't convinced the man was being straight with her. Though I believe he came to see Andre... It's possible he had a secondary reason, checking up on this man. Do you have a name for this man? I asked. Benjamin Stevens. And what did Daryl's sister have to say about the relationship? It could just be a case of brotherly overprotection. I attempted to reach her, but she's out of town at another business conference and isn't answering her phone. As soon as I reach her... I'll get back to you with her response. And I'll keep you posted on what's going on down here, I said. I appreciate that. Selena will be reporting, but it's always good to have more than one source. We hung up. Did you hear all that? I asked Alex. I did. Apparently some things have changed since I talked to him last. I didn't know he'd gotten married or that his father had passed. Yeah, but do either of those things really make a difference? Chaos jumped down from Alex's lap and stretched. Maybe. Getting married is a big deal. You probably should have asked more about that. If she's the jealous type or wanted out of the marriage, that gives her motive. My question is why Andre felt the need to move away from his pack right when he needed the support the most. I lifted a shoulder. People grieve in different ways. Maybe he just needed to escape his ghosts. Alex hummed a tentative agreement, but he didn't sound convinced by a long shot. That leaves us with two suspects at the top of the list, Andre and the wife. Don't forget about the guy Daryl's sister met, Chaos said. If Daryl did meet him and found him lacking, they could have had a run-in. It seemed the more I learned, the more people joined the list of people I needed to talk to. Great, because it wasn't like I was rushing to beat the clock on anything life-altering. Chapter 6 
Chapter 11 I spent the evening doing a little digging. Since I couldn't interview the people in New Orleans directly, and I wanted to wait to interview Andre until Selena was there, I checked the next best place. Social media. People spewed everything about their lives on there, and I found that sometimes it was a much better meter of what a person was like than talking to them face to face. Andre, as expected, didn't have an account. Daryl did, though, and I found his wife through them. Fortunately, all the accounts were public. That made it easy for me to nose through pictures and posts at will. Daryl was a little thin, mostly pictures that he was tagged in rather than that he uploaded himself. Most of them were with his wife, Amandine, or from her profile, Mandy for short. He looked happy in most of them, though his smile looked a little forced. That could have been because he didn't like pictures, though. There were a few of him with his parents and several more with a group of guys doing different activities, including off-roading, crabbing, and fishing. There was even one of him holding a gator. His smile looked real enough in those. Basically, it was a superficial profile depicting times when he was having fun with others. Nothing personal at all, except for a post when his dad died. Mandy's, on the other hand, was a virtual diary where she seemed to vomit every single thought that flitted through her brain. It took me ten minutes to get through the week. I had to read through everything from what she had for breakfast to whether or not she should wear the yellow tube top or the green tank top. It was nauseating. The one thing I did find, though, was that Ms. Mandy was extremely possessive and insecure. She mentioned a couple times in just the last week that this waitress or that gas station attendant had made googly eyes at Daryl, and she complained in one that he'd smiled back. Her friends looked to be as dizzy as she was because they all responded with emoticon hugs, yuck faces, and hearts. That was food for thought, though. Those kinds of women, and men for that matter, bore watching when it came to crimes of passion. Barnaby Dupre's was about like Daryl's. In fact, they shared many of the same pictures, and both guys seemed to be genuinely having a good time in all of them. Selena, on the other hand, was like me. She had hers set to private, so I couldn't dig up any dirt on her. Alex made some phone calls and found out she was just an average person. Though she did play a significant role in pack business, it was mostly on the paperwork side of things. She was on the treasury board as well as the genealogy board. So out of all the people he could choose as his second, why her? I asked Alex. Not that she wasn't qualified, but she didn't stand out in any way whatsoever. He shrugged. All we know are bare-bone facts about her. I'm sure Barnaby knows her strengths and weaknesses much better than we do. Trust me, with a brain as analytical as his, he evaluated her from every direction before he made his decision. I guess we'll get a chance to form our own opinions tomorrow, I said. It looks that way, he answered, then reached over and gently pushed my laptop closed. But for now, put it away, and let's push murders and motives out of our heads for the night. There's nothing more we can learn anyway. I'm starving, and I've missed you. He pulled me up from my chair and wrapped me in a hug, and for a few hours, I tried to do exactly that. I had a bad feeling it was the last pleasant evening I was going to have for a while. Chapter 12 when I woke up the next morning, I was surprised to find a text message from Charlotte, my magical mentor. It read, I know you're available this morning, and I know Alex is back in town. See you both at 10. I have no idea how she did that, but it made me crazy. She always seemed to know where I was at at any given time, and though she swore she didn't have some kind of magical bug on me, it sure seemed that way. Sighing as I took a sip of my coffee, I showed it to Alex. His phone was upstairs on the nightstand, so he ran up and got it. I got one, too, he said as he tromped back down the steps. Almost verbatim. It looks like we're going for a lesson, then, I said. Truth be told, 
I needed as much knowledge as I could get. I didn't like not being able to access my magic when I needed it, and I'm a perfectionist. If I'm going to do something, I'm in all the way. We should probably fill Sean in on what's been going on anyway, I said. Sean Castle was an ancient vampire and the town's founder. For obvious reasons, he couldn't stay in town for more than a decade or so at a time, but he'd just gotten back after having been away for his requisite few decades. Usually, he showed up and just pretended to be a descendant. This time, he hadn't made up a story and folks were taking it in stride. In fact, I wasn't even sure most people outside the magical community even knew who he was anymore. He'd won the town on a bluff in a poker game and took great pride in it. If I didn't tell him what had happened, he'd be offended. Since he was sort of my friend as well as a vampire powerful enough to turn me to dust, I tried to stay on his good side. Glancing at his watch, Alex said, We're going to have to push it if we're going to get there on time. It's after nine already. Chaos hopped up on the table and grabbed one of the orange rolls I'd made for breakfast. I wasn't much of a cook, but even I could handle canned biscuits. Usually, anyway. She shot me a look that dared me to say anything, and I just snapped my mouth shut. It was a fight I wasn't going to win anyway. Maybe it was time to change tacks and up our exercise. If she didn't get food from me, she just bummed it from the neighbor, a kindly little old lady who thought she was adorable. In truth, she was. Her fur was gleaming white except for a black streak that ran down her back and across her face, a few black spots, and black-tipped toes. And she had huge, luminous green eyes that she knew how to bat in order to wrap just about anybody around her little paw. You're going, too, I said. Of course I'm going, she said, licking frosting off her paw. I'm your familiar. Last time, she'd put up a fuss because Charlotte had gotten on to her at the previous practice, so I was a little surprised she was so eager to go. Then I realized what her game was. Alex was in town, and he was her favorite person on the planet. I rolled my eyes at her, but she just took another bite of the orange roll, her eyes gleaming with satisfaction. I wish I'd thought to ask Barnaby what time Selena would be here. I said twenty minutes later as we climbed into Alex's car. I'd like for us to go have lunch with Zach. I haven't stopped in to see him in a few days. How's he doing? Alex asked as he navigated out of the drive. Zach's is a long story, but to summarize, we'd basically had to alter his memory or kill him. Not all of it, just parts of it. So far, it was working well, but it still worried me. I also had a fair amount of guilt, but I soothed that by telling myself he was much happier and doing what he was meant to do now. That was true, but I still questioned the whole messing with fate thing. So far, so good, I answered. He managed to turn his sandwich shop into a mini sports bar. You can hardly get in the place on Sundays. He even hosts an after-hours party on Mondays and Thursdays for the games. Alex raised a brow and gave me a sideways glance. How does that work? He charges a set amount and makes sandwiches and hors d'oeuvres ahead of time so he can watch the game. He already has a beer license. To make things easy on himself, he sells beer tickets separately, and you just drop a ticket in the can when you get a beer out of the ice chest. And he just trusts people to not drink all his beer for free? Alex hadn't been raised in a small town like we had been and was skeptical about the concept of the honor system. I don't think he really cares that much, but I'd bet dollars to donuts he doesn't lose much to that. We chatted about his trip for the rest of the ride, and when we pulled into Sean's curving drive, I was surprised to see several cars in the lot. Alex found a spot that was out of the way. Is there something going on this weekend that I don't know about? I shrugged. Heck if I know. You know Sean. He does like his parties. I picked up the lion's head knocker and dropped it. He had a traditional doorbell, but I preferred the knocker because I knew his butler hated it. 
Rather than the sourpuss who pushed my buttons as hard as I pushed his, Sean himself opened the door. When he saw us, he gave us a broad smile. Just who I was expecting, he said. Charlotte told me you were coming, and it was perfect timing. I have something I want to discuss with you. From the look on his face, it was a sure bet that my news was worse than his. Yeah, I've got something I need to talk to you about, too, I said. Perfect. Let's go to my office now. We followed him to a set of elaborately carved pocket doors, and he slid them open. There was a fire in the fireplace, which was weird considering it was in the 80s outside, but it was his house. If he wanted to turn it into a sauna, who was I to say anything? After sliding the door closed behind us, he turned around, an uncharacteristic grin on his face. He was good-natured, but tended to be a bit reserved most of the time. I gave him the side eye. What's got you so hyped up? He held up a finger. First, is your news good or bad? Decidedly bad, I replied, glancing at Alex. He just looked as confused as I felt. Well, then my news first, Sean said. Okay, shoot. You know how many businesses in town are having a hard time staying afloat? Yeah, I said, drawing the word out and narrowing my eyes. I've decided to rebrand us, he said, adopting that goofy ear-to-ear -ear grin again. I was almost afraid to ask and was glad Alex did it for me. Into what, exactly? Into a high-end supernatural vacation spot. I still own several vacant properties around the area, and I'm going to turn them into mini-resorts. That way, the town will see more business, will have more jobs, and everybody will thrive. At first blush, it sounded like a grand idea, but then the logistics of it, along with one word in particular, sank in. Did you say supernatural vacation spot? I did, he said, glancing back and forth between Alex and me. I got the idea when you were telling me about the beach resort your cousin works at. What's it called again? Enchanted Coast, I said, afraid of where this was going. But there are no humans there, and the entire point is that people can be themselves. There's no way we can pull that off here. Sure there is, he said. We just have to figure out the logistics. The logistics were that I'd have to triple the police force, explain all the traffic, and hope none of the creatures that he invited had a taste for humans. You know, like vampires. My day had gone from bad to worse because once Sean set his mind to something, you could bet your bottom dollar it was going to happen. I wondered if it was too late to give up all my responsibilities and actually join my cousin at her Gulfside resort. About ten of those drinks served in a pineapple sounded like nectar right about then. Chapter 13 I started to argue with him, but figured I'd give him some time to start turning it over in his head first. He wasn't prone to spontaneity, so I was hoping when he sat down and started doing the numbers on it, he'd realize what a hot mess he was brewing. So, I snapped my mouth shut before I could ask him what he'd been smoking. You said you had news? Bad news? He said, raising his inflection at the end to make it a question. Telling him was a mixed bag. He had a ridiculous number of contacts and never hesitated to use them to help me, but it also meant he'd be right in the loop. Of course, that had never been a bad thing, but it felt weird to me to have somebody besides me and Sam and now Alex, knowing all the details of a case. The flip side of having all those contacts was that he'd know everything anyway, so there was no point in trying to keep it under wraps. I took a deep breath and launched into the story, leaving nothing out. When I finished, he chewed on his lip, thinking. Are you finished with the scene? He asked. I nodded. Then I believe I'll go see for myself. Living as long as I have does have its advantages, as does being a vampire. 
Perhaps I'll be able to pick apart the scents a bit better than you could. He wasn't being arrogant. He was being honest, and I knew it. I hadn't even considered that, but his sense of smell was much better than mine. It couldn't hurt for him to try. And I have many friends in New Orleans. His eyes glittered with dark humor. The city used to be such wicked fun a couple centuries ago, before I redefined my definition of the word. I rolled my eyes. New Orleans was notorious for being a vampire nest in that era, and I could only imagine the good times he was referring to. Yeah, well, I've never been there, but I'm sure it's a barrel of laughs. Some insider insight into the pack would be nice, though. I feel like I'm working with one arm tied behind my back here. Alex had been quiet, but finally spoke. I don't have to tell you what's at stake here. We've worked long and hard to pull this treaty together. In order for it to work, everybody has to agree to it. He waved us off. I'm aware of Miranda's pet project. If you ask me, it's been a long time coming. With the invention of modern travel and communication, keeping separate legal systems has become archaic and dysfunctional. I raised a brow because he was dead set against vampires joining the rest of the paranormal community. He gave me a cool look. Though many think vampires should be included in your coalition as well, it's a bad idea. We've operated under one system of laws since the beginning of time. The system works. Vampires aren't like other supernatural creatures. Our very natures demand that we feed on others in order to thrive. We're perfect machines of destruction. Speed, strength, compulsion, beauty, virtual immortality. Everything about us is designed to conquer other species. Therefore, our laws are harsh by necessity. Tell me, what would a life sentence mean to a being who lives forever? And how would you enforce it? Walking out of even the highest security prison would be child's play to even a new vampire should he or she desire to do so. He waved a hand. It's ludicrous to even contemplate. When he put it like that, it actually made sense to me. I hadn't given much thought because it wasn't my thing. I had enough to worry about without tossing universal paranormal politics into the mix. I cleared my throat and decided that no response at all would be better than any I could come up with. Thanks for any info you can get on the NOLA pack for me. I appreciate it. Of course, he said, putting his hands on our shoulders as we turned to leave the study. How are your studies going? He'd been the one to arrange for Charlotte to tutor us, though I wasn't sure why. With Sean, you never knew. He could have some ulterior motive, or it could have just suited his fancy to be nice. For some reason, in this instance, I think it was the latter. He was a generous man to those he cared about, and he had a mentor relationship with Kat. Maybe that got me in by proxy, or he just didn't want me burning the house down because my magic went wonky. No way to tell, but I was grateful because nobody wanted me to have control of my magic more than me. I believe Charlotte is waiting for you in the courtyard. She's quite miffed that you haven't been as diligent as she'd like. I wasn't sure what Charlotte's deal was for sure. I was fairly certain she didn't live there full time, and I didn't know the extent of her powers. Maybe she teleported there. Chaos seemed to pick up on what I was thinking. You know, she said, her tail swishing as she walked beside me. Charlotte might be able to shed some light on what's going on. She always knows more than most of the other witches around here do about the bigger picture. The thought gave me pause. She was an elemental witch, and nobody was more in tune with the moon's phases than they were. Not even werewolves. Maybe she would have some clue as to what was going on. Chapter 14 Charlotte was waiting out back for us. John had a huge open courtyard behind the mansion that he often used for cocktail parties and other soirees. He was big on entertaining and had one party or another going pretty much every weekend. 
Curls bobbing, Charlotte waved an impatient hand. Come on now, we don't have all day. Some of us have a brunch to get to, so chop chop. Yeah, I said, one brow cocked, and others of us have a murder to solve, but don't let us keep you. Alex covered his laugh with a cough, but not so well he didn't earn a sharp look from our mentor. She tilted her head and studied me. What's this about a murder now? Somebody killed a man, a werewolf, in a cabin sometime yesterday morning or the night before, and it's not your typical garden variety murder. She was quiet for a moment, and it felt like she was looking into my soul. You felt this coming, didn't you? There was no need to deny it, so I nodded. I did, and worse, I still have a bad feeling. Well, she said, knitting her brow, with a super blue blood moon coming, that's not a feeling you should ignore. Yeah, I said. My friend, the leader of the local bear clan, says there's a bad moon rising. He has a bad feeling, too. She thought about that for a second. Wonderful things are possible on such a night, but horrible ones are, too. It's all a matter of intent. The local coven is planning an All Hallows' Eve gathering. Perhaps you and Alex should speak with their leader and see if she's had the same sense. That was a meeting I'd been avoiding. I was firmly established as the local pack leader, and wolves and witches didn't mix. I was a rare combination brought about because my mother had been bitten by a werewolf when she was pregnant with my sister. My father had taken her in when she exhibited signs of the change, and somehow she'd managed to come through. For the longest time, I'd thought the witch gene had skipped me, but I was wrong. That left me in a politically challenging situation. My entire life, I'd identified as a wolf and still did, but now I had to accept being a witch, too. I'll also try to look forward and see what I can see, but for now, let's get to your lessons. Look forward? Alex asked as we walked to the far end of the courtyard. Her mouth tipped up in a secretive smile. I have my tricks. I don't like to do that particular one much, because nothing good ever comes of knowing what's in store. If I want to know if it's going to rain, I'll do what everybody else does and watch the weather channel. I just bet she did. I'd never met anybody so in tune with their surroundings, but I let it slide. But it sure would make my job easier if I could take a peek back in time. Okay, she said, jerking me out of that line of thought. Today we're going to work on defensive spell work. Do either of you know how to build a wall? Just with bricks, Alex said, earning him an eye roll from both of us. Well, I'm going to teach you how to build one even a bulldozer can't knock down. I figured with the work both of you do, it would be a good place to start. And it's easy, too. Or it should be, anyway. We worked on it for the next hour, and we both had a decent grasp on it by the time the lesson was over. Excellent, she said when I managed to deflect both a mental attack and a physical one at the same time. She'd thrown a lightning bolt at me, though, so I had incentive. I was happy that she didn't manage to disarm me mentally, though. Alex took to it like a duck to water, and soon she had us practicing on each other so that we were using both defensive and offensive magic. Even with chaos backing me up and boosting my power, it was all I could do to hold off some of his attacks. Once, a fireball almost slipped through. I could literally see it burn a hole in my shield. Still, between the two of us, we managed to hold it off by pulling some water from a nearby bird bath. The bluebird bathing in it wasn't so pleased, but neither was I when I saw embers floating downward toward my new boots. After that, she called it a day, and we went to the back patio, where Sean did indeed have a brunch laid out. I was famished, and if the way Alex was piling food on his plate was any indication, so was he. We were almost finished eating when Sean joined us, a glass of faux o and a wine glass. That still creeped me out a little, because Kat drank hers from what we called her juice box. 
I had a stomach of steel and, as a wolf, had no compunction about eating rare meat, but just drinking the blood was different somehow. I wasn't judging, just cringing a little inside. He took a seat at the table and moved a coaster over so he wouldn't get any stains on the white tablecloth. Meanwhile, I thoroughly appreciated a couple of petty fours his cook was famous for. I had no idea how she did it, but they were perfect every time. So I made a couple calls, Sean said, taking a sip from his glass. And? Alex asked, popping a bacon-wrapped scallop in his mouth and handing one to Chaos. She shot me a satisfied look, and I decided then and there I was fighting a losing battle. And it seems all was not well in paradise, at least from Mr. Beauchamp's perspective. Apparently, his wife is quite clingy, and they've had a few rows where he's left the house in order to avoid physical altercations. I wondered about that, I said, licking the remaining frosting off my fingers. Her Facebook page had a couple posts about other women looking at him that seemed a little over the top. Waitresses and such. Most of the time, it's the spouse, Alex said. Combine jealousy with claws and teeth, and you have a recipe for disaster. That doesn't explain the claw marks, though. Fred said they were too big to be a wolf, I replied. I also checked with some local shifters around here, Sean said. They've seen the same tracks in the woods, one toe missing from the left right. You'd think that would be something somebody would know about. I munched on a scallop as I thought about it. I don't know, Alex said. My dad was missing his pinky toe from where he got caught in a trap when he was a kid, and nobody outside the immediate family really knew about it. It's not like it's something that comes up in conversation. Maybe, I replied. I guess if you think about it, hey, my name's Corey, and I have webbed toes, isn't exactly the way a conversation usually goes. Alex glanced at me as he stuffed another scallop in his mouth. I never noticed you had webbed toes. I cocked a brow at him as Sean stifled a laugh. I think she was just using that as an example, he said. Oh, Alex replied, shrugging. Wouldn't matter to me. I'd love you webbed toes and all. Every woman should be so lucky. Chapter 15 I'd planned to stop and have lunch at Zach's, but when we left Sean's, I thought I was going to need a wheelbarrow to roll me to my car. Alex was in the same shape, so we decided to just stop for a coffee and to say hi when we could. We stopped at my place to swap cars in case I needed the four-wheel drive, and Kat was awake. What are you doing up? Alex asked. It's the middle of the day. Yeah, I know, but another of the bartenders called off. There's nobody to cover the lunch shift, and Rox can't do it because he says he has a migraine. She scowled. I suspect it's more to do with the gallon of Bloody Marys he drank last night, but he's the boss. She grumbled as she pulled a juice box out of the fridge and stuck a straw in it. I swear, there's no such thing as work ethic anymore. This chick knew when we hired her that most of the rest of us were vamps. That's why she got the day shifts she asked for. But this is like the third time she's called off in the month and a half she's been working there. Who is it? I asked. I hadn't noticed any new bartenders, but then again, I didn't usually go to the hook in the daytime either. She waved her hand. Some fluff piece. I don't know where she's from, but she's making my life hell, and I don't appreciate it. This was supposed to be my day off, again. Well, I'm glad I caught you anyway, I said. I found out who the mystery guy was who was talking to Daryl, some guy named Andre Glapian. She sucked on her straw as she waited for me to continue. Okay, she said when I didn't. Is that supposed to mean something to me? I don't know. Has he ever been in there before? 
He's a wolf shifter and had a relationship with Bouchamp, but I don't know anything about him other than that he lived in New Orleans until recently. She shook her head. No idea. Never seen him before. But he didn't strike me as a drinker. Since she'd been a bartender, since they were considered fallen women, I'd take her word for it. Nobody I knew was a better judge of character than she was. But if you ask me, he didn't seem like the type to kill somebody, she added. I furrowed my brow. You can tell that just from watching him for five minutes? Pretty much, she said, lifting her shoulder. Even from that distance, he put off a concerned vibe. He was mad at the guy, but he wasn't in a murderous frame of mind. I'm going to talk to him this afternoon. The New Orleans PAC representative should be here any time, so I was waiting for her. Easier to just let her be there than to try to explain it to her and have her second-guess me. They're sending down a rep? she asked. Why? You've got this under control, right? So far, I answered. But it's not like I have anything solid nailed down. Hell, I don't even have a solid suspect. Actually, Alex said, you have too many solid suspects, which is the problem. The wife did it, Kat said in a definitive tone. And how do you know that? I asked. She sucked the last of her breakfast out of her box and tossed it in the recycle bin after she pulled her straw out of it. Because the spouse is always the one who did it, she smiled. Don't you watch enough crime TV to know that, Sheriff? Nah, I'm more of the Vampire Diaries type, I said, trying to keep a straight face. She wrinkled her nose and waved her hand. Please, that's just vampire soap opera. Posers, and bad ones at that. They wish they were as cool as I am, though they'd probably be bored with my life, seeing as how I don't go around killing my friends or random strangers in an alley. They'd last all of ten seconds before the council staked them all for being laughing stocks, if for no other reason. Vampire TV was one of her biggest amusements, or pet peeves, depending on her mood. We had Buffy afternoons where we just sat and laughed, and we did watch The Vampire Diaries, but she considered it a sitcom. So who's this rep they're sending? Kat asked. The person Barnaby Dupre has chosen to replace Daryl, I said. She furrowed her brow. That was quick. Not really, Alex said. He's a planner, so he's probably had her picked for quite a while. Curious, she turned to me. So does your mom and dad have a backup plan for if something happens to you? Probably, I said, though I hadn't given it much thought. They'd probably make one of my brothers come take my spot. Kat had been to a couple of my family reunions and raised a brow. Then I beg you, stay safe. I loved all my brothers, but they had huge personalities. Plus, both single ones tried to hit on her at the last gathering. To say she wasn't a fan was an understatement. My phone dinged with an incoming text. It was Barnaby and said, Selena's flight was delayed. She won't be there till eight tonight. Well, all righty then. I groaned in frustration. It looked like I'd have to talk to Andre alone. I'd already wasted half the morning waiting on her, and I wasn't willing to stand around twiddling my thumbs for the rest of the day. I fired back an okay to Barnaby, then told Alex what was going on. So what about Andre? Alex asked. I'm not comfortable letting this investigation get away from us. The window is closing. I'm with you. I grabbed a couple bottles of water out of the fridge and stuffed them in my backpack. I wasn't exactly a purse kind of girl because I needed more room and I didn't want to dig for something when I needed it. Let's go. Cat, have a good day at work. Are you working a double? Oh, hell no, she said. I wasn't supposed to work at all today, and Rox is working tonight. He may have the mother of all hangovers, but he doesn't roll like that. Okay, see you tonight, I called over my shoulder. Maybe, she called back. 
My butt's going to be dragging, so I may have to go to bed early whether I want to or not. That was going to mess with her rhythm, both natural and habitual. As a vampire and a person who worked nights, she was used to sleeping most of the day. I called Ms. Ellen to see if she could shoot me Andre's address, and it only took her five seconds to rattle it off. She knew that system inside out because it was her system. I tried to figure it out once when she was on vacation. Suffice it to say, her job was secure. Since I'd obviously run out of luck, reference dead guy in the cabin and no solid leads, Andre, of course, lived in the boonies. It would take at least 45 minutes to get there, and I was glad we'd brought the jeep because we were going to need it. By the time we pulled up to a ramshackle house in the middle of nowhere, I wasn't sure which had taken more of a beating from the potholes and ruts, the jeep shocks, or my teeth. All hopes of it being a smooth and formative interview went right out the window when I turned my head to open my door and found myself staring straight down both barrels of an old side-by-side 12-gauge shotgun. The day just kept getting better and better. Chapter 16 Whoa there, buddy! I said, putting my hands where he could see them. His hooded hazel eyes were narrowed, and he was glaring at me like I'd just eaten the last piece of cake and smacked his mama to get it. He glanced back and forth between me and Alex. Who are you, and what are you doing on my place? I guess maybe I should have put the blue bubble on the dash, or maybe worn my uniform, but I hated that thing. The closest I got to a uniform was putting a blazer on. I did, however, have my badge clipped to my belt along with my handgun and cuffs. Somehow, I didn't think going for my weapon was the best choice here, though. Maintaining eye contact, I introduced myself. I'm Sheriff Corey Sloan. We met a few months back when you first came to town. This is Alex Dixon, a contractor with the department. He squinted at me for a couple seconds, then lowered the shotgun, but kept it in position at his side for easy access if he needed to swing it up again. I remember you. What do you want? Didn't you see the no trespassing signs on your way in? In fact, I had, which should have prepared me for the situation I currently found myself in, but it had been a while since I'd encountered somebody who didn't recognize me on sight. I did, But I must have missed the ones that read, Trespassers will be shot. We just need to talk to you about Daryl Beauchamp. He pulled his brows together, and I was beginning to wonder if he idled at Cantankerous, or if I was just getting special treatment. What do you want to talk about him for? He's in New Orleans. Haven't seen him in months. So far, Alex had kept his mouth shut, but that was short-lived. Do you mind if we at least get out of the Jeep and discuss this like civilized people? I can't say I'm entirely comfortable being a sitting duck. Andre thought for a second, then stepped back so I could open my door. Alex and I stepped out of the truck, and he came around to my side. Andre took our measure again, then turned toward his house, motioning for us to follow. I don't have no fruit-fruit drinks, but if you want a beer or a Dr. Pepper, I got those. He said as we stepped onto the rickety steps. Dr. Pepper will be great, I said. Beer for me. Alex raised his brows when I gave him the side eye. What? I just had a shotgun pulled on me. I'm pretty sure that warrants something stronger than a soda. Plus, he said smirking, I'm not on the clock. Andre went into the house and returned a minute later carrying our drinks and a beer for himself. Have a seat, he said, motioning to a couple questionable-looking lawn chairs while he took a seat in an ancient but sturdy rocker and leaned the shotgun on the doorframe beside him. So why do you want to talk about Daryl? I thought he was still pushing for that damn New World Order crap. Did he do something else? When was the last time you saw him? I asked, easing into the chair in case it was as dry-rotted and unstable as it looked. When it held, I leaned back cautiously and opened my soda. 
Told you, I ain't seen him in a few months, he said, but he didn't look me in the eye. Alex looked askance to me to see if I wanted him to push, and I shook my head. I was the authority figure here, and I wanted it to stay that way. You sure about that? Because I have somebody who says they saw you arguing with him at the Rusty Hook a couple nights ago. He pulled in a deep breath and blew it out, scowling. Fine, he said. I went there to talk to him about family stuff. What sort of family stuff? Again, he averted his eyes. Just stuff. He snapped his eyes to me, finally realizing there was something way wrong if we were there. Why? What's it matter to you what we was talking about? Did that boy do something crazy? Is that why you're here? I knew he was mad, but I didn't think he was going to do anything about it. That caught my attention. Mad about what, exactly? He glared at me. I'm not saying another word until you tell me why you're here. I cleared my throat. Mr. Glapian, I'm sorry to be the one to tell you this, but Daryl was killed night before last. He looked like he'd taken a ball to the gut from the shotgun leaning behind him. His Adam's apple bobbed a few times and his eyes became glassy, and it killed me that I was the one to deliver such misery. Killed? How? And by who? He croaked a few moments later, staring straight ahead into empty space. He was attacked in a secluded cabin. He bled to death. I didn't figure there was any need to get into the details because my gut was screaming that this man had nothing to do with it. I didn't want to cause any more pain than I already had. Who did it? Alex leaned forward, elbows on knees. We don't know. That's why we're here. We're hoping you could shed some light on the situation. Why was he down here? He wanted to find out more about the guy his little sister was keeping time with he said. And what did he find out? I asked. Daryl didn't like him, but that was mostly on principle. He didn't know much about him other than that he'd been in a couple scrapes with the law and that he met his sister at some hooey inspirational conference. He said he was meeting him that night to get a better feel for him. I wouldn't think a cabin in the woods would make for much of a meeting place, though, Alex said. That doesn't make any sense at all. Andre shook his head. No, he said he was meeting the guy at his place, then going for a run. He planned to come see you the next day, Sheriff. Wanted to meet informally and talk about your silly idea to screw up a system that's worked for hundreds of years. He was all for it, and that's what we were arguing about. I pulled in a deep breath and counted to five to keep myself on track. It's not my idea, but I support it. The system did work until modern communication and travel made the world a much smaller place. That's not why I'm here, though. I'm trying to find out who killed Daryl. You want that, too, right? Andre looked as if he'd aged ten years in five minutes, but there was a fire in his eyes I didn't like. You bet I do. I told his pappy I'd look after him. The way he said it had a bit of an eye-for-an-eye eye feel to it. Leave it to me, Andre. I'll handle it. See that you do, he said, stuffing a wad of tobacco in his cheek. Otherwise. It was my turn to narrow my eyes, and I put a little bit of bass and alpha in my voice, though it was a gamble, since I wasn't his alpha. I said, leave it. He looked me dead in the eye, but didn't say anything. The only thing he'd heard was my voice, not my directive, though I had no doubt he knew what I'd tried to do, and it likely pissed him off. Suddenly, I was exhausted. The last thing I needed was this guy taking justice into his own hands, especially if Benjamin Stevens was innocent. Then I'd have two murders on my hands, and one mourning misguided old man I'd have to lock up, at least until his death sentence was carried out. One more reason why I had to find this killer, and fast. Chapter 17 What do you think? 
Alex asked after we were back in the jeep and far enough away that we were out of hearing range. I think we need to go see Benjamin Stevens. But first, I'd like to run a background check on him. And I need to check in with Sam. He had his annual physical this morning, then was going to pick through Colleen's findings if she has them ready. My stomach rumbled. It had been hours since the brunch at Sean's, and between the magic session and my natural wolfy metabolism, I needed food. Alex heard it and grinned at me. What say we stop at Zach's and grab a sandwich? I say it sounds like a grand plan. We can see how he's doing, plus I want you to see what he's done with the place. We drove in silence for a few minutes. Am I the only one worried Andre is going to take things into his own hands? He asked. I shook my head. Nope. That man had fire in his belly. He loved Daryl, and if he's dead set that Benjamin Stevens killed him, that shotgun's going to be used for more than scaring people. He sighed. I got the same feeling. I think we should have Barnaby give him a call. I saw what you tried to do. I also saw that it didn't work. I know, I said. And I don't like it. Call him, if you would. While he called Barnaby, I mulled over what we'd learned. I was missing something, because no matter what scenario played out in my head, it didn't end up with him dead at that cabin. The sister was out of town, so had she come to stop him? Maybe it turned ugly. Still, that wouldn't have happened in the cabin. My stomach rumbled again, and I tried to quiet my brain. I wasn't going to accomplish anything until I'd eaten something. Maybe my brain would work a little better once I had some calories in me. Alex hung up the phone. He said he'd call Andre and tell him to let us handle it. I asked if the sister was back in town yet, too. He said she's not answering his calls, which is unusual. I glanced at the clock on the dash. It was almost four, so Selena wouldn't be in town for another four hours. That gave me plenty of time to grab something to eat and track down Benjamin Stevens. I called Ms. Ellen and asked for his information, but she said she had to call me back. Apparently, there was a squabble in the lobby. Something about Halloween decorations and naked people. The joys of small-town living. Zax was busy when we pulled into the lot. I was glad to see he was doing so well. Before he'd been sucked into a life he never deserved, and that we deleted from his memory, he'd always wanted to own a restaurant. The sandwich shop was the perfect solution. It was small enough that it was easy to manage, but popular enough that he made plenty of money. Plus, he still got to indulge his love of sports. His face lit up when he saw me, and a little flash of guilt snapped me before I could block it out. A lifetime ago, we'd been two teenagers in love, with the world by the tail. My mother had separated us because he wasn't a werewolf, and she was a firm believer in not mixing with humans. Her views on that had softened some with age, but I couldn't help but agree with her just a little. After all, it would take a special person to accept all of a werewolf's idiosyncrasies. The result, though, was that he still had feelings for me, but I couldn't return them, not knowing that his reality was altered. Hey, guys, he said. Alex, long time no see. How have you been? Alex grinned as he looked at all the TVs and sports memorabilia on the walls. Not as good as you, it seems. This place looks amazing. He stepped closer to a hockey stick mounted on the wall. Is that a signed king stick? Zack beamed with pride. Sure is. From the 93 finals. My dad had a friend who took us. Made a whole vacation out of it. Yeah, but that measurement call? I know, Zack said. I thought there was going to be a riot. Since I had no clue what they were talking about, but was happy they were happy, I helped myself to a sweet tea and got one for Alex, too. I took the lid off the soup of the day and was ecstatic to find it was loaded baked potato. My favorite soup ever. And I'm not speaking generally. I mean Zach's in particular. He loads it up with bacon and cheese and some special blend of spices that makes it to die for. 
Since they were still talking hockey and my stomach was convinced my throat had been cut, I helped myself to a bowl and took it to my table. Zach and I were close, mostly because I cared about him, but also partly because I worried about him. That meant I was there at least three or four times a week and was used to just helping myself. Both men turned to me after I took the first bite and groaned as the flavors burst in my mouth. Zach was smiling, but Alex raised a brow, a smirk on his face. You need some alone time with that? I grinned, but didn't stop eating. Nah, it's not going to be around that long. And don't judge me before you taste this. He wasn't much of a soup guy. Instead, he always went for a hot roast beef sub, triple meat, and extra mayo. Fine, he said, sliding in beside me. You've finally worn me down. Give me a bite. I glowered at him and put my arm in a protective curve around my bowl. No, get your own. Zack laughed. Better watch it, Alex. She's like a she-wolf when it comes to that stuff. She'll take your arm off if you get too close. I grinned at the unintended accuracy, showing Alex my teeth, a gesture well understood in the wolf world. Zack made our sandwiches while they caught up, then did a round to make sure all his other customers were set and joined us. We chatted for a few minutes until the bell above the door chimed, announcing a new customer. A tall blonde woman walked through the door, looking around as she did so. Zack stood to greet her, and she froze, an awkward smile on her face. A Zack? He tilted his head to the side and examined her, his face open and friendly, but without a hint of recognition. I'm sorry, but have we met? He asked. Hurt crossed her face. I know it's been a long time, but I didn't think you'd forget me. Diana, we met when you were in Columbus on business a couple years ago. Columbus? His brow creased in confusion. I've never been to Columbus on business. Oh, crap on a cracker. A couple years ago, Zack had been a werewolf hunter, and if he was in Columbus on business, there's a good chance that's what he'd been doing, which meant he had no memory whatsoever of any of it, including this woman. I needed to call Sean and fast. Chapter 18 Fortunately, vampires are fast, and I hoped Sean was available. I had him on speed dial, and it took me all of three seconds to explain the situation after he answered. Meanwhile, Alex did the one thing he could think of to distract him. He knocked my soup bowl to the floor. It shattered into about a million pieces, wasting half of that luscious manna of the gods along with it. It did the trick, though. Zack held up a finger to Diana. Excuse me, just one minute, okay? She nodded, but the hurt look didn't go away. Unless I missed my guess, there must have been a spark between these two back when they'd met. He ran behind the counter and grabbed a handful of towels along with a bus tub. I'm so sorry, man, Alex said, leaning down to help him clean it up. Or at least he was pretending to. What he was really doing was swirling it around and making it worse. Don't worry about it, Zack said, then glanced up at me. Lucky for you, it wasn't the last bowl. Yeah, because then I would have had to kill him, and that would have been way too much paperwork. Just as they put the final towel full of gunk into the bin, Sean strolled in. Hey, Sean, I'll be right with you. I just need to mop this real quick. Take your time. He said, then stepped up to Diana and touched her lightly on the shoulder. Excuse me, ma'am, but where did you get that wonderful bag? My girlfriend would just love it. I wasn't sure what he was doing, but I trusted he did. The woman's eyes went a little out of focus for a minute or so, and Sean stared at her intently. He released her, and she gave her head a little shake. I'm sorry. What? Sean smiled and stepped back. I was just complimenting you on your bag. Oh, she said. Thanks. 
It was a gift from my parents, so I'm afraid I don't know where they got it. Excuse me, just one minute, he said, then disappeared into the back in the direction Zack had headed. Not wanting to leave the poor woman standing there, I went behind the counter and asked her what she wanted. I already knew there was plenty of soup for me to have another bowl and share with others, so I recommended it to her. That sounds wonderful, she said, and her voice was cultured but friendly and definitely southern. I'll take a cup of that and a chicken salad sandwich to go with it. And a Diet Coke, please. I got her soda, then started making her sandwich. Nothing there was ever pre-made. I was just about finished and was starting to get worried about Zack. I plated her sandwich and grabbed a cup for her soup when they came back out. Zack stepped from behind the counter when Alex took the mop from him. I'm sorry, Diana, he said. You look so different from when we met in Columbus. Your hair is so much longer and lighter, too. It took me a minute to recognize you. Breathing a sigh of relief, I handed him the cup of soup so he could give it to her, then went back to the table where Sean and Alex were talking. How did you do that? I leaned over and whispered. Luckily, she was already thinking about their encounter, and I already knew his brain inside out, so I pulled her memory, then filled in the gaps in his. She had no idea what he was in town for, and now he thinks he was there for a get-rich-quick house-flipping conference event. I raised a brow and blinked. A house flipping conference? Really? Even I can only think so fast, he snapped. Besides, those things are a dime a dozen, so it was easy to make the details fuzzy. Anyway, now he remembers her. That was too close, I said. What if something like this happens again? Then we'll deal with it, Sean said. This was a fluke, though. He still has most of his memories. I just altered them a bit to cut out the werewolf hunting stuff. I don't know why he didn't remember her. It honestly could be that she just wasn't that memorable to him. I watched as they chatted, and if he didn't remember the first time they'd met, he'd definitely remember the second. I do know that Zack had been so uber-focused on killing every werewolf on the planet that he had serious tunnel vision, so maybe she was just another rose that he hadn't stopped to smell. She took her lunch to a table, and he followed her, carrying her drink for her. A little sizzle of jealousy shot through me, though I know it wasn't rational. However, Zack had been my first love. The sight of him chatting with a pretty woman he was obviously attracted to was a little awkward for me, probably because it was the first time I'd seen it. Now I knew how he may have felt when he watched me with Alex. I gave myself a shake and pushed away such silliness. Zack was my past, and Alex was my present, and possibly my future. I gut-checked myself and found that to be an absolute truth, then hoped Zack found the same happiness I had. Since Sean was already there, I filled him in on the visit with Andre. Don't you find it just a little suspicious that the sister is incommunicado? Sean asked. That had been bothering me. I do, but I'm not sure what to do about it. I don't think there's much we can do about it, at least for now, Alex said. It's only been a day. It's not like she couldn't be busy with business, or maybe in an area that has bad reception. He was right, but it wasn't like there was really anywhere in the civilized world where somebody couldn't check voicemail or texts. It was an anomaly, and I didn't like it. Do you remember what kind of relationship they had? I asked Alex. Ah, Sean said, raising a finger. I did some checking of my own, as I said I would, And it turns out Daryl and his sister have some serious daddy issues. Daddy issues? Alex and I said together. Yes, Sean said, a world-weary look on his face. The only kind of daddy issues that really matter at a time like this. Daddy left most of the money and the house to Daryl. It seems Dahlia, that's his sister's name, wasn't so good with money. 
so he put her share in a trust fund to be released only after she has her first child after marriage. She's allotted a monthly stipend for living expenses, a generous one by most standards, but chicken feed to what she was used to spending. She can access more money, but it has to be approved by the trustee. I ran a hand through my hair, then held it back from my face. Let me guess, Daryl was the trustee of her fund. Seeing as how I was neither an accountant nor a millionaire, I only had a vague idea of how such things worked. So what happens to the main estate if Daryl dies? Funny you should ask, Sean said droll. All but a small marital trust goes to Dahlia. Well, hello, motive for murder. Chapter 19 Sean had to get back to his house to prepare for the Halloween festivities he had planned for the weekend and mentioned his grand idea again. My concern escalated when he said he'd invited potential investors to his party. So this isn't just a social gathering you're hosting this weekend, then, I said. There's no reason I can't mix a little bit of business with pleasure, he replied. Besides, what better time to announce an exclusive paranormal vacation spot than on Halloween? I've invited some people that you'd refer to as high rollers, and I have no doubt there will be interest. Sean, I beg of you, think this through before you go with any big reveals. I was surprised and disappointed that he was being so reckless. It wasn't like him. Look, Corey... We have no place we can go and just be ourselves unless we want to go to the beach. And you know that even with the enchantments, vampires and sunshine aren't an ideal combination. We want something in a cooler climate that offers plenty of shade and shelter. This is the perfect location. I'll beef up security out of profits so you don't have to worry about that. Doubt still sat heavily on my shoulders, but he owned the land and could technically do with it as he pleased. The resort will be self-contained. All that will really change is the shops in Castle's Bluff will see more business. Is that really a bad thing? When he put it like that, I could hardly argue, but I couldn't shake the feeling of unease. Just promise me you'll look at this from every angle before you set anything in stone, okay? He waved me off. You know I never make a business decision without doing that. My accountants and lawyers are examining it as we speak. I'd rather you think it through, looking at the situation as a whole, rather than just from the paranormal side. I said. He patted my hand, which would drive me nuts if anybody other than Sean did it. I had enough respect for him that I let it pass. You know I want what's best for this town, he said, looking me in the eye. I'll make sure Castle's Bluff is the first and foremost consideration before I finalize anything. That was the best I was going to get, so I nodded. I had a murder to solve, and I could deal with the rest of the crazy once that was done. Alex and I were meeting up with Sam to review anything fresh from the case. We'd arranged to get together at Sully's so we could see if he'd learned anything, and it was about time to head there. Sam beat us there and already had a cold beer in front of him. Rough day? I asked as I scooted onto my regular stool beside him and hung my backpack on the hook underneath the bar. He snorted. You could say that. Gertrude was in again today complaining that the neighbor's Halloween decorations are too macabre and make too much noise. Oh, for Pete's sake, I said, then felt guilty. That made two days in a row Sam had been forced to deal with her. He smiled a little. Don't feel too bad. Ms. Ellen stepped in and told her that no Halloween decorations they had in the yard could possibly be scarier or noisier than their neighbor. It took Gert a minute to catch on, but once she did, the little old lady fur flew, and I snuck out the back door to come here. Miss Ellen, bless her heart, handled Gertrude for us on a regular basis. 
I think it was one of the ways she got her kicks, and she said things that Sam and I could never get away with as public officials. Sometimes, though, Ellen couldn't make her mad enough to leave in a huff, and she'd still insist on filing a claim. Sully slid a beer in front of me and another in front of Alex before we could even order anything. Not that I was complaining. I assume now that you're all here, you're ready to eat? He asked. Actually, Alex said, we just ate at Zach's. I glowered at him. One of us ate at Zach's, I corrected. The other one of us had her soup knocked to the floor and had only ordered a ham sandwich to go along with it. That had just taken the edge off, and considering I'd been famished when I went in, my tank was still only a quarter full. Sully grinned and looked at Sam and me. That'll be two cheeseburger specials, then? We both nodded. Every once in a while, I'd switch up my order and do a filly, but that was rare. I didn't see any reason to fix something that wasn't broken. Al had already seen us, so Sully held up two fingers. Sam's and Corey's, he said. The eternally happy cook nodded and disappeared from the window. A second later, I heard the sizzle of meat hitting the grill. Now that we have that taken care of, said Sully, I have some news. I did talk to somebody that knows a guy missing his pinky toe and he lives close, so you shouldn't have any problems finding him. His name's Buddy Langley. He works as a dishwasher at the diner. That's great, I said. Finally, a lead. Sully held up his hand. Not so fast, though. The kid is a good guy, and on top of that, he ain't quite right in the head. The woman I talked to says he was born a little slow. Everybody describes him as a big teddy bear, pardon the pun, that wouldn't hurt a fly. I heaved a sigh. So not a slam dunk. Sully shook his head. Not by a long shot, if you ask me. Several people all said the same thing, and everybody kind of watches out for him. He has a job and holds his own, but... Yeah, but... I said deflated. Sully paused. And Corey, everybody loves this kid. If you give him a hard time, it's gonna cause problems. I mentally bashed my head against the bar. It would have been so much easier if the guy was a jerk with a criminal background a mile long. But so far, nothing about this case had been easy, so I don't know why I expected it to start now. Chapter 20 By the time eight o'clock rolled around, I had a full belly and was ready to call it a night. I had hoped that Selena would want to settle in and get started in the morning, but of course, she didn't. When my phone rang with the New Orleans area code, I answered. Corey? A smooth female voice asked. Yes? I said, a little irritated for some reason that she'd address me by my first name rather than by my title. Considering I was lead on the case and a couple steps above her on the pack politics food chain, it was a little disrespectful. This is Selena Moreau. I've just arrived and thought we could meet so you can catch me up on the case. I wanted to put her in her place by telling her we'd wait until morning but I wanted to start the relationship off on the right foot. Normally, I would have, but with the treaty coming up, I was walking a fine line. We could do that, I said, keeping my voice neutral. Where are you staying? She rattled off the name of the hotel, the best one in Castle's Bluff, along with her room number. I just ordered room service, but I should be finished by the time you get here. Again, she was walking on the edge of the knife and apparently realized it because she added, If that works for you. It was a backhanded way to show respect, and I'm sure she knew it, but in the scheme of things, it was better to get along than to get off on the wrong foot by following her lead and starting a pissing contest. That will be fine, I said. We'll be there in 20. I motioned to Sam and Alex. Let's go. Her Highness awaits. 
Alex was quieter than usual, but I didn't pay it much mind because Sam kept up the conversation. What do you think about this, kid? He asked. I gave it some thought. I think we need to talk to him before we make any solid decisions. I have a feeling we're going to have to tread carefully with him. You know how bears get when you mess with one of them, especially one they consider weak. I knew it all too well. I also knew that the bear population had close ties with the local fox pack, and they weren't fans of the treaty. The only reason they were going along with it was because Sully and his team had convinced them it was a solid way to move forward. We'll be careful, but we have to at least talk to him, I said. That's a given, he agreed. I'd suggest we play it by ear. I nodded and turned into the hotel parking lot. The evening was cool and the scent of fall was on the air. The hotel was decked out in full Halloween regalia, and I smiled when I saw a werewolf, blood dripping from its fangs, situated not too far from a Dracula-esque vampire. The owners of the hotel were human and had no idea how many of the monsters they had on display actually lived all around them, albeit in not-so-heinous forms. Selena's room was on the second floor, and there was a room service cart sitting outside her door, stacked tall with dirty dishes. Alex was still quiet and hung back as I rung the bell. Weird. He was usually right behind me, ready to step forward as soon as I introduced him. I rang the bell, and a drop-dead gorgeous blonde opened the door. You would have never guessed she'd been traveling all day. Her hair was swept into an elegant French twist, and her business suit was expensive and impeccable. She didn't even have so much as a smudge of mascara under her eyes. You must be Selena, I said, holding out my hand to shake. She took it, but looked past me to Alex. I'm Sheriff Sloan, and this is Deputy Sam Cassidy and Alex Dixon, a consultant. She gave Sam a disdainful look, then shifted her eyes to Alex. Her expression lit up with a familiarity I didn't understand as Selena stepped back to allow us entry. Oh, Alex and I go way back, don't we, sugar? What the hell? I watched Alex's face. A faint blush swept across it as he looked at me, not quite meeting my eyes. Then guilt, and finally, acceptance. Hello, Selena. It's nice to see you again. Sam had stepped up to my side, and I felt him looking at me. I glanced up at him, and, unlike me, his primary feeling at that moment seemed to be consternation. And how exactly do you two know each other? He asked before I could. Selena gave him a long look, not bothering to hide her contempt. You're human, she said. That pissed me off. He is, and he's also my second-in-command and has every right to be here and to be treated with the respect that accompanies that position. She turned her gaze to me, shock written on it. Your second? As in your beta? I pulled in a deep breath, then released it, counting to five as I did so. Obviously not. He's my second-in-command as sheriff. I have no beta. That was an unusual situation, but I really had no need of one, as small as our pack was in the scheme of things. Since I answered directly to my mother and father, and this region's pack was a subsection of the Southwest Regional one, a beta was unnecessary. I was told Alex was beta, she said. You were misinformed, I said, drawing my brows together. I'm not sure what personal relations you have with Mr. Dixon, but I can assure you, you'll be dealing directly with me. I infused a little bit of alpha into my voice for good measure. She narrowed her eyes at me, but realized she was towing the line and dialed it back. My apologies, she said. I meant no disrespect. I was just excited to see Alex again and thought he'd found a position he deserved. Finally, Alex opened his mouth. I do have a position I deserve. I'm a representative of the entire Southwest Regional Pack, and am here in a support role for Sheriff Sloan. 
I looked at him again, and this time he met my gaze. I didn't like being out of the loop and was irritated he hadn't told me he knew Selena, but I had bigger fish to fry. We spent the next hour bringing her up to speed on the case. We waited for you to get here before we interviewed Benjamin Stevens, and since we just learned about Buddy Langley, we obviously haven't talked to him either. We'll be doing that first thing in the morning. Selena glanced at the clock on the nightstand. Why not right now? It's only 8.30. If this bear shifter works at the diner, it's possible he's there now. I said, we'd do it in the morning, I replied. So we'll pick you up at 8. That will give us time to grab a coffee and breakfast before we speak to Benjamin Stevens. Under different circumstances, I may have agreed with her, but I needed to put her in her place now before she got it in her head she could ride roughshod over me. I was the one in charge, and I was going to make sure she understood that. She opened her mouth to argue, then arranged her expression into one that showed a smidge more respect. Eight o'clock it is, then. She turned to Alex. Would you like to stay for a nightcap? Catch up and talk about old times? It was all I could do to maintain a blank expression, but I did. No thanks, Selena, Alex replied. Sometimes the past is best left in the past. I gave him a few points for that, but he was still at a serious deficit. I didn't like being blindsided, especially when I couldn't think of a good reason for him to have done so. Once we were back in the car, Sam made a point to climb into the front passenger seat, forcing Alex into the back. As we pulled out of the lot, he said, Mind telling us what that was? Or should we just assume it's none of our business, as your behavior implies? Alex heaved a sigh. Selena and I went out a few times years ago. I had no idea she'd bring that up, though. I didn't mean to hide it from you, and I'm sorry. I glanced at him in the rear view. Yeah, me too, I said. You put me at a disadvantage, and I don't appreciate it. Silence reigned all the way back to the station, where I dropped Sam off at his truck. I was tempted to toss Alex out there, too, but his car was at my house, and I wasn't that petty. I did, however, give him the cold shoulder all the way there. Once we pulled in, I went straight to the house, calling over my shoulder, I'll meet you at the hotel at five till eight in the morning. Chaos was waiting for me on the porch and hopped up when I opened the screen door. She followed me in, then hopped up on the kitchen table. I was so irritated that I didn't even bother getting on her for it. You gonna tell me, or do I have to guess? She asked as I pulled a beer out of the fridge. I gave her a rundown of the situation, and she was thoughtful for a few minutes. So, is this woman naturally catty and disrespectful, or do you think it has to do with her relationship with Alex? I don't know, I said. I can deal with her just fine, but I'm not sure what to think about the way Alex handled it. She flicked her tail, irritation shining in her big green eyes, then she humphed. Men, she said. Can't live with them. Can't turn them into pillars of salt anymore either. Well, technically you probably could, but that would be a tough one to explain. That made me smile. Come on, she said. Make us some popcorn and we'll watch a good horror flick. It is, after all, getting close to Halloween. As I popped a bag of popcorn into the microwave, my thoughts drifted that direction again and that feeling of impending doom returned. I didn't know what was coming, but that was probably a good thing. Had I known then, I would have been tempted to pack my bags and head to the Enchanted Coast to visit Destiny. Since the gift of sight wasn't in my toolbox, I stuck around, unwittingly waiting for a world of pain. Chapter 21 Rather than the quiet night that I'd planned, Kat had convinced me to indulge in an impromptu night out with her and the rest of the girls. When I woke up the next morning, I had a pounding headache and felt like I'd gotten no sleep at all, which was pretty darned close. 
We hadn't gotten in until two, then Kat and I had talked about the whole Alex thing for another half hour. When my alarm went off at 6.30, it was all I could do not to fling my phone against the wall and go back to sleep. Instead, I popped some Advil and took a shower. By the time 7.30 rolled around, I had a couple cups of coffee and was feeling halfway normal again. Chaos had sat up late with us and refused to get off the couch to go with me. That wasn't that unusual, though. She rarely went along on police business. Sam called on my way to the hotel to let me know he was going to talk to some of the people who knew Buddy. He was concerned about rattling the hornet's nest if there was no need to, and my gut told me the kid was in the clear. I agreed that was a better use of his time than going on an interview three of us were already handling. Alex's car was already in the hotel lot when I pulled in at a quarter till eight, and the green monster inside of me wondered if he'd stayed there. I shoved the thought out of my head. Despite being mad at him, I trusted him and wasn't prone to jealousy in any case, regardless of the fact that I'd had two brushes with it in as many days. Any residual doubt I had slid away when he stepped out of the car when I pulled in. Are you going to let me explain? He asked. Not now, because we have business to conduct. That's a conversation for another time when we're not on our way to interview two suspects. I need a clear head to do that. For now, just forget it, and I'll pretend I'm not ready to punch you for lying to me. I didn't technically lie to you he said, which only served to make the situation worse. A lie of omission is still a lie, I replied. When we got to Selena's room, she was ready. She was wearing clothing more appropriate to the situation this time, though she still looked ready for the runway. Who are we talking to first? She asked. I'd called the diner on my way there. Buddy Langley was working the breakfast shift and didn't get off until two. Benjamin Stevens, I replied. It seems logical since we know Daryl was going to talk to him that night. We need to find out if they actually met, and if so, how the conversation went. And how do we know he'll tell the truth? She asked. Alex spoke up. She has a built-in bullshit meter. I picked up a note of pride in his voice, and my irritation slipped a notch. Oh, yes, Selena said, a hint of disgust in her voice. I'd forgotten, you're half witch. Technically, she's a quarter witch, Alex said, a hint of warning in his tone. And if you remember, I'm a full half, so you may want to keep that in mind. Selena looked away, and for the first time, I saw just a little bit of that arrogance slip away. I'd forgotten. No offense intended. Have you eaten? I asked, since I'd mentioned coffee and breakfast the night before. I have, she said. Let's just get to it if it's all the same to you. It was, by a long shot. The last thing I wanted was to sit down to a meal with her. I'd gone past jealousy to just plain dislike. Thankfully, Benjamin had an apartment in town, so the ride was short. We'd taken my jeep because, if I were being honest, I didn't want to let even that much control slide. The woman seemed to have trouble grasping the concept that I was in charge, and I was going to reinforce my status until she got it right. I couldn't, for the life of me, understand why Barnaby had chosen her as his second. She had the tact and couth of a washerwoman. But that wasn't my call, and all I could do was settle this case as quickly as possible so I could get rid of her. Luck was with us, and Benjamin was home. The expression on his face was surprised, but friendly, as I explained what we wanted to discuss. Still, there was something squirrely about him I couldn't quite put my finger on. Would you care for something to drink? Coffee? He asked. No, thank you, I said. We just have a few quick questions, then we'll be on our way. Sure thing, then. Please, sit down. His apartment was neat as a pin, 
and I notice coasters around the table rather than in the holder. To make it almost impossible to miss the hint, the glasses were not to be placed on the wood. I picked up the slightest hint of pot on the air and checked his eyes. They weren't bloodshot or glassy, and his pupils looked normal, so I wrote it off. We understand Daryl Beauchamp was coming to see you about his sister Dahlia. His expression morphed into regret, though it didn't quite look genuine to me. Ah, yes. Mr. Beauchamp had some reservations about our relationship. That's what we understand, Alex said. Did you meet with him? Unfortunately, no, he said. We were supposed to meet the evening he was killed. That set off my meter, though I don't know why. We aren't sure exactly when he was killed. So what makes you think it happened in the evening? His facade slipped a bit. I just assumed, since he was found first thing in the morning, that he'd been killed the night before. And what exactly is your relationship with Dahlia? Selena asked. He lifted a shoulder. We met at a business conference in Savannah and hit it off. We've been talking back and forth, getting to know each other. The distance is a barrier, but I'm considering moving up there if things go well. As a graphic designer, I can work from anywhere. Have you spoken to her in the last few days? His face lit up. We speak every day. I just FaceTimed with her yesterday. Selena's expression became speculative. That's odd, because her alpha's been trying to get in touch with her for two days with no response. Did she tell you where she's at? Something akin to panic flitted across his face before he could catch it. Maybe it was the day before yesterday that I spoke with her. He screwed his face into what I assume was supposed to be concentration. Yes, now that I think about it, it was definitely the day before yesterday, early in the morning. I glanced at Alex, then at Selena, who was obviously about to call him out on it, and gave a small shake of my head. Standing, I said, Thank you very much, Mr. Stevens. If we have any more questions, we'll call. Please don't leave town so we can get in touch if we need to. Relief flooded his countenance as he followed us to the door. Of course, Sheriff. Anything I can do to help. I waited until we were back in the car to say anything. He's lying, I declared about not meeting with Daryl and about talking to Dahlia. I agree, Selena said. But even innocent people lie. Maybe he was just afraid of getting into trouble. Or maybe he killed him and doesn't want to die, Alex said. I agreed with Alex, and not just because I despised Selena. The little rat was hiding something. Chapter 22 The breakfast rush was just ending when we got to the diner. Like every other store, it was decorated, but in this case, it was a little more generic. No werewolves or fake Draculas, just spider webs and tombstones and the random skeleton or two. Dana, the owner of the diner, was a fox shifter, so she knew how things really were. When we walked in, she was wiping down one table while a large man, who I assumed was Buddy, loaded the dirty dishes from another into a bus tub. She looked up and grinned at us, then gave Buddy an encouraging smile. Y'all come on in, she said, striding down the aisle. Take a seat and I'll get you some coffee. She stopped Buddy as he walked past her. Honey, they're here to talk to you, okay? Go with them and I'll be right there. He nodded and sat the bus tub on a cart at the end of the counter. Rather than heading to my regular booth, I chose a larger table toward the back of the restaurant where we could all sit comfortably and speak in private. Buddy was a big guy, well over six feet tall and at least 250, and it wasn't hard to imagine him being the bear that made that track. He was fidgeting and looking everywhere but us, and it didn't take much to understand what Sully'd said about him. Selena started to ask him a question, but I held up my hand. I wanted to wait for Dana to get back, because I wanted him to be as comfortable as possible. She glared at me, 
and I held her gaze until she looked down. Don't worry, buddy. We just want to ask you a few questions, okay? I said, trying to put him at ease. Dana joined us, a tray of coffees in hand. She distributed them along with a glass of tea for Buddy, and as soon as everybody had their coffee doctored the way they liked it, I dove in. Buddy, we found a special paw print outside a cabin where a man was killed. It was a bear print, and one of them was missing a toe. I understand you fit that description. He glanced at Dana, who nodded. Tell them the truth, buddy. I'm missing a toe, he said. On this foot. He held his left foot out and started to take off his white tennis shoe. That's okay, buddy. You don't have to show us. Is it your pinky toe? He nodded, and as he put his foot back down, I noticed a fleck of red on the side of it. I realized Selena, who was sitting on the other side of me, but had craned around so she could see his feet, noticed it too. She narrowed her eyes. Were you in Fred Hutchinson's woods night before last? He glanced at Dana again, who nodded. I roam in those woods a lot, he said. It's open, and there's a stream that has lots of fish. I remembered that the prince ended at the stream and got a bad feeling. Buddy, were you there night before last? He paused before shaking his head. No, I wasn't. I sighed. My gut was saying he was lying, but I didn't think he was the killer. It just didn't sit right with me. Are you sure? Maybe you were there early in the evening, or maybe you saw something at the cabin that scared you? That got an instant reaction. I don't know what cabin you're talking about. One look at Selena told me that, regardless of what my gut was telling me, I was going to have to take his shoes at the very least. Concern and fear were etched on Dana's face. My guess was that she'd seen the shoes too. Buddy, I see something red on your shoes. Can you tell me what it is? I asked as gently as possible. He tucked his feet under his chair. Probably just paint. Me and my friend were painting models yesterday. Lying. I'm going to have to take them, okay? I said. No, he replied. They're mine. We know they're yours, Alex said, using the same gentle tone I had. The last thing we needed was somebody his size getting upset and physical but we need to make sure that's just paint. You can have them back when we're done with them. He started to protest again, but Dana put her hand on his arm. Give them your shoes, sweetheart. I'll call your dad and have him bring you another pair so you don't have to go barefoot. I have another pair in the truck, he said. Even better, I replied. Tell us where they are and Alex will go get them for you. I didn't want to give him the chance to wash whatever the red was off his shoes by letting him go get his other ones himself. He huffed out a breath. They're in the passenger floorboard. Without another word, Alex got up from the table and went to go get them. Within five minutes, we had the ones he was wearing bagged and were out of there. Why aren't you arresting him? Selena demanded. Because we don't have cause to yet, I said. If that's not blood, there's no reason to put him in jail. It's not like he's going anywhere. She opened her mouth to argue, but I pinned her with a glare. I'll arrest him when I have evidence that he may have done something wrong. That's my final decision. She snapped her mouth shut, but her cheeks flamed red with anger. I'll take these to Colleen, our CSI, and she can analyze it to see what it is. I said... Then I glanced at Selena and Alex, remembering his car was there. I'll drop you two back off at the hotel before I do. I don't think there's anything else to be done until we find out what that is. What I really wanted to do was call my mother and get her take on the situation. I didn't want to piss off the New Orleans pack, but I wasn't going to put an innocent man in jail just to please them either. Especially when my gut was telling me he wasn't the murderer. Still, I had a feeling he was at the cabin, and he knew more than he was letting on. 
There was also the fact that the bear population in town would see it as discrimination when I had so little evidence and at least one or two other suspects that were just as viable as Buddy. Man, I hated politics. All I wanted was for my little town to go back to the way it was. That reminded me of Sean's shenanigans, but I couldn't think about that. One catastrophe at a time. Chapter 23 As soon as we got to the hotel, Selena stormed out. Alex, however, paused. Why don't you let me go with you? After all, I am here to help. I sucked in a tired breath. I had enough on my plate without expending emotional energy on a personal situation. Just give me some space, Alex. I need to call my mom after I drop these shoes off, then go talk to Sully. This has the potential to get ugly fast, and not just for us. The bears have a ton of pull around here. If we alienate them, I promise you, the foxes and badgers will go with them, and all the hard work my mom's done for the last two years will go down the toilet. He huffed out a frustrated breath and ran his fingers through his hair. Fine, but we need to talk at some point. There's nothing to talk about. I'm irritated you lied to me, but I don't think there was any malice behind it. And I don't think there's anything going on now. Just leave it, please. Okay, he said, but it was obvious that it wasn't okay with him. He climbed out of the jeep and into his car, then watched as I pulled away. I was glad to see Ms. Ellen when I walked in the front doors of the courthouse. She was a soothing constant in what felt like a whirlpool that was sucking me down. As I greeted her and walked past her desk, she held up a hand to stop me. Pulling open a drawer, she pulled out a plate full of cookies shaped like ghosts and witch hats. As always, she'd gone all out and wrapped them in orange cellophane and tied them with a black bow. Smiling, she handed them to me. I know it's been a rough few days, and there's nothing like a good cookie to make a girl feel better. The witch hats are frosted with chocolate for that added boost. Miss Ellen, you know I love you, right? I said, taking the platter. She winked at me. Of course you do, sweetie, and I love you back. I don't make special cookies for just everyone. That was true. Her cookies were legendary in Castle's Bluff, and to receive a platter of them just for you was indeed an honor. I was gloating a little as I headed to the office I shared with Sam, then noticed he had a plate too. Good. That meant I didn't have to share mine with him. If the half-empty plate was any indication, he was munching his way through his fourth or fifth cookie at least. He looked up at me, and relief spread across his face when he saw my cookies. That's great, he said. I thought I was going to have to share with you. I tried to keep a straight face as I motioned toward his plate. Were you planning to share them or eat them all before I got here so you wouldn't have to? He gave me a guilty smile. I'd have given you one if there were any left by the time you got here. Raising a brow, I said. Yeah. Well, don't expect me to share mine because you pigged all yours down at once. Like I wasn't about to do the same thing. What's on your agenda? He asked as I pulled off the ribbon and took the plate out of the cellophane. And did you learn anything from either of the interviews? First, I need to call my mom, I said. Things are wonky. I don't know what, but Benjamin Stevens' explanation stinks. And Buddy was hiding something, but I didn't get the feeling he was guilty. I reviewed both conversations with him and told him about the shoes. I don't know, Corey, he said, leaning back in his chair and propping his feet up on his desk. If that turns out to be Daryl Bouchamp's blood on his shoes, you're going to have to bring him in. I bit the head off a ghost and chewed. I know. I just wished he'd have told us the truth. And that story Benjamin switched up about talking to Dahlia? He's either lying to protect her or to protect himself. I don't know which, but he's definitely lying. And I didn't like him. What did you learn from talking to the bears this morning? 
That to a man, they're behind Buddy. All of them say he couldn't have done it, and all of them are prickly about it. If we have to arrest him, or, God forbid, we convict him of it, all hell's gonna break loose. Great. I ate one more cookie, then called Mom. When she answered, she was all business. When she was all caught up on the investigation and the politics I was dealing with, she was quiet for a few minutes. You don't think this buddy is guilty? Sighing, I said. I know he's lying about something, but I know in my gut he's not the killer. Then follow your gut and I'll deal with the fallout from the NOLA pack. You know the folks in your region much better than I do, and if you think the kid's innocent, then do what you can to avoid losing their allegiance. If they all bail, the treaty's dead in the water. Okay, then, but if that blood comes back as the victims, I'm going to have to arrest Buddy. Cross that bridge when you come to it and stick to your guns. Your gut won't steer you wrong. We hung up and I was glad for once to have talked to her. Chapter 24 I'd just finished another cookie when Ms. Ellen buzzed to let me know there was a Mandy Bouchamp on the line for me. As soon as I realized who she was talking about, I licked the chocolate icing off a witch hat for fortitude before I picked up my phone and hit the button. Sheriff Sloan, how may I help you? I said, pretending I had no idea who she was. Make her work for it. This is Amandoum Bouchamp, she said in a voice that I was sure had spoken at many junior league events and high school bullying incidents. What can I do for you, Mrs. Bouchamp? You can arrest the man who killed my husband is what you can do, she clipped. Breathe in, breathe out. I'm planning to do exactly that as soon as I know who killed him, I said, doing my best to rein in my temper. Just the sound of her voice was like fingernails on a chalkboard. From what I understand, you already know who killed him. Stop the presses. What? I don't know what you've been told, but you've been misinformed. I don't believe I have, Ms. Sloan. I understand you found a bear shifter who was at the scene and had blood on his shoes. Now I was losing my temper and I was going to kill Selena. That's Sheriff Sloan, and there's no proof this man was at the scene that night or even that the substance on his shoes is blood. Not that the details of an active investigation are any of your business. And I don't believe you understand what's at stake here. We're all watching what your definition of justice is, and I have to say, so far, we're not impressed. If this is how you handle things down there, then we're not sure we want to be included in any treaty that approves of that. Look, I said, this is my town and my investigation. When you gain adequate training and experience and become an active part of it, I'll give a damn about what you think. Now, I'm sorry for your loss, and I'll let you know the minute somebody is arrested. I hung up, not giving a crap if I'd offended her. My mother was more than skilled enough to deal with a rookie snob like Mandy Bouchamp. Mom would eat her for breakfast and pick her teeth with her bones. That sounded... less than pleasant, Sam said. I snorted. She's an entitled little snot used to getting her way by bullying people. When you stand up to people like her, they have no idea what to do. Are you going to say anything to Selena? He asked. Absolutely, I said. I've been looking for a reason since she got here, and now I have it. But I'm not doing it over the phone. Oh, man, he said. I'm not going to miss this. Then you better put down that cookie and get in my Jeep. I can eat on the fly, he said, grabbing one for the road and following me out. I called Mom back when we were on the way and explained the situation, including the lack of respect the woman had shown since the minute we met. That won't do at all, dear. You need to show her who's running things and make it clear as a bell. Don't damage her, but make sure she gets the point. 
What about Barnaby Dupre? What about him? She said. Barnaby is a man who understands and respects power and chain of command. If she stepped out of bounds, and she has, he'll likely not only support you, but issue his own reprimand for representing their pack badly. As a matter of fact, call him after you deal with her and explain what you've done and how she responds. Let me know how that goes, dear. I'd been a tad worried Mom would lay down the law and tell me to step down, so I was elated that she was fully behind me. It tickled me even more that she may get taken down a peg or two by her own pack leader, too. I called Alex and asked him to meet me there so I'd have an official witness. He'd been at Zach's, which was right down the street from the hotel, watching a game and was waiting in the parking lot when we got there. I always kept a spare trench coat in the car, and I tossed it to Alex when we got out, barefoot. Shoes would just get in the way. Both of you stay out of it, I said, striding toward the hotel. This is between me and her. I had to pound on her door twice before she opened up. She saw who it was, and her lips turned up into a satisfied smirk. Are you here to pick me up so we can go make the arrest like we should have earlier? I pushed her backward, then followed her into the room. Alex and Sam stepped inside and closed the door but stayed back. I'd pushed her hard enough that she fell backwards, and I shifted on the fly, landing so I was straddling her, my teeth on her throat. I nicked her throat just a little. She whimpered, a sign of submission, and turned her head away from me. Like I said, 99.9% of the time, all it took to knock a bully down was standing up to them. Placing my front paw on her chest, I shifted back, then jerked her to her feet, the residual power from shifting still coursing through my veins. Pulling her close so we were face to face, I said, You made the mistake of interpreting my spirit of a cooperation for weakness. Don't do it again, because the next time, I won't be so nice. This is my town, my investigation, and my people. You're here as a representative of your pack and privy to inside information because of my goodwill. Report back to Barnaby, but if any more information gets leaked to people outside your direct chain of command, I'll bounce you out of here so fast your head will spin. And trust me, you'll be the worse for wear. Have I made myself clear? She pulled back, tears in her eyes. Yes, ma'am, she said, putting her hand to her throat to assess the damage. That's more like it. I said, then spun on my heel and stepped into the trench coat Alex was holding open for me. Without another look at her, I spun and left, Alex and Sam right on my heels. Way to go, little girl, Sam said once we were outside. I have to say, I'm a little turned on right now. Alex said, and Sam punched him on the shoulder. I don't want to hear that crap. She's still a little girl in pigtails to me. Sam grumbled, and I smiled. That had felt fabulous, even if it had cost me my favorite slacks. Chapter 25 What didn't feel fabulous was the call I got on the way back to the office. I didn't even have time to call Barnaby before Colleen called me. She pulled a sample off Buddy's shoes, and it was indeed blood. Not only that, it matched the blood of the victim. My heart sank. There was no way I was going to be able to avoid arresting him now. Rather than go back and get Selena, I left her there to lick her wounds, so to speak, and call Barnaby directly. First, I explained the situation with Selena, and as Mom predicted, he wasn't pleased. I chose her as my second-in-command specifically because she shows restraint and makes good decisions. Obviously, I was incorrect. I knew she and Amandine were friends, but I assumed she knew enough to keep her personal and professional life separate. Rest assured, I'll deal with her when she gets back. Unfortunately, that's not the only reason I'm calling, I said, dreading telling him about the evidence Colleen found. 
My CSI pulled a sample of blood from a young man's shoes and matched it to Daryl. He's also missing a toe. I went on to explain my gut feelings and the repercussions that were likely from the Bear Clan. I'm on my way to arrest him now, but I want it known up front that I don't think he's the one who did it. He was obviously there, but it's not sitting right with me. He considered that for a moment. I'm a firm believer in following gut feelings, but in this case, the evidence appears to be overwhelming. Have you gotten a hold of Dahlia yet? Benjamin's statement was off. He said he'd talked to her yesterday, but then he changed his story when I told him you'd been unable to contact her. I haven't, he said. But I say we move forward with the bear and continue to investigate. We can't let politics get in the way of justice. You don't want that now, do you? It seemed an innocuous enough question, but there was weight behind it. Again, I was under the magnifying glass and out of options. No, I do not. Finding the killer is my priority. And I trust the proper punishment will be dealt? He'll go before our council like any other shifter would. His fate will be determined by his peers. It doesn't sound to me like his peers are willing to prosecute him, he said, and my hackles rose a little. I assure you, justice will be met. We hung up, but I could feel the whole thing unraveling. I decided to stop and inform Sully of what I was doing before I went and picked up Buddy. For the first time in my life, I was standing on the opposite side of the line from him, and he didn't like it any more than I did. You're making a mistake, he said. I realized that, and to be fair, I don't think he did it. Just please give me space and any resources you have to prove it. But for now, I have to pick him up. Surely you can see that. I can see that you're arresting a man who you know is innocent, Cordelia. His use of my given name stung, and it also let me know where he stood. We were not allies in this situation. All I could hope for was for something to come to light, and quick, that absolved Buddy. You know she's only doing what she has to, Sam said, and I appreciated the support. Sully just stared at me, his expression closed. My feet felt like they weighed a ton as I stepped into my jeep and pointed it in the direction of the diner to do what I knew in my heart was wrong. On my way there, Alex called me. I don't know where you're going, but you need to turn back. A girl, a bear shifter, was attacked last night, and they have her at the hospital. I just heard it on the scanner. Attacked by what? I asked, turning my truck around. Our dispatchers were, for the most part, shifters. When a member of the shifter community was injured, a special code was used to indicate what sort, so our ER nurses in the know would know what to be prepared for. Nobody knows. Her roommate came home and found her in their backyard. She was clawed and also had defensive wounds. Though they shredded the flesh so badly, Colleen can't tell what it was. I think whoever did this thought they'd killed her. Do they at least know if it was a bear or a wolf? I asked. No, Alex said. At least not yet. But Corey? I hated it when he used that tone. It was never good. Buddy had a crush on her, and she kept shooting him down. He even showed up at her place a couple times with flowers, and she was kind of mean to him, according to the roommate. Goddesses help me. Talk about more nails in his coffin. I hadn't even figured out how to pull the first ones out, and now I had a half a dozen more. Chapter 26 I went and checked on the girl. Her name was Wendy Ray, and as Alex had said, Buddy had been at her house a few nights back, and she'd shot him down hard. After talking to Colleen and the girl's friends and parents, I made my way to the diner. If luck was with me, he'd still be there. I didn't want him to be at home, where I'd have to defend myself to his clan. Sure enough, he was. 
Sam was already with me, but if Buddy decided to shift and fight, I'd need Alex to help me take him down without hurting him or letting him hurt us. Alex had already figured that out and was on his way to the diner. We beat him there by a little bit, and as soon as we went in, Dana's expression shifted from pleasant to protective. She'd grown up with my Aunt Carol and was always glad to see me. Not this time. What are you doing, Corey? You know he didn't do this, she said. I nodded. My gut says he didn't, but the evidence says he did. She snorted. What? A few flecks of blood on his shoe? Maybe he was there after the fact. Taking a deep breath, I stopped. Holly Pierce was attacked last night, I said. She froze in her tracks. Attacked? Yeah, I said. Mauled and left for dead. I guessed from the look on her face she was making the connections. I still don't believe he could do anything like this. What does Holly say? Nothing, I replied. She's in a coma. Thankfully, she was a shifter, or else I have no doubt she would be dead. She stepped aside. Buddy's in the back, she said. Come on back, and I'll help convince him to go with you without a fuss. Thanks, I said. Buddy didn't exactly go quietly, but he didn't shift and try to kill us either. He kept insisting he was innocent and that he'd just been out for a run in the woods that night. As far as Holly was concerned, all he'd kept saying was that he loved her and would never hurt her. By that time, I was doubting my own gut. By the time we got to the courthouse, a crowd had gathered. They were carrying signs protesting the arrest and calling for the demise of the treaty. According to Bear Law, they had the final decision about arrests, which was one of the reasons we truly needed the treaty. Everybody needed to be held accountable to and by the same set of laws and the same court. I pushed through them with my head held high. It wouldn't do to show doubt or weakness, but I felt like a fraud. We booked him in and made sure he had a decent mattress, books, and access to the TV. After I left, I went to Sully's. Hopefully, he'd still serve me a beer, at least without spitting in it first. He did, but it wasn't with the great aplomb that he usually did. He slid it in front of me and walked away even though the place was empty. The smiling jack-o'-lantern lights seemed to be laughing at me rather than cheering me up. Sully, I said, and he turned to me. What, Cordelia? Can we please talk about this? You know as well as I do, I don't want him in that jail. Tell me something that will help. He lumbered back down and leaned his elbow on the bar beside me. I know what you have on, buddy, and I can see where you're coming from, he said. What I don't know is what you have on anybody else. That's just it. I said, studying the bubbles pushing up the inside of my glass. I don't have anything but suspicions. The sister, Dahlia Bouchamp, is MIA, and she has a lot to gain from his death. Her boyfriend, Benjamin Stevens, was supposed to meet with Daryl the night he died, but says he never did. I frowned. There's something off about him, but I can't for the life of me figure out what. Sully shook his head. I know Benjamin Stevens, and he was in here the night Daryl was killed. I didn't think of it until you just said that, but he was here with some other guy. The reason it stands out is because he'd been in here a couple nights before with a cute chick that he introduced as his girlfriend. Wait, so you're saying Stevens was here with someone? I pulled up a picture of Daryl Bouchamp on my phone. Was this him? Sully looked at the picture. Yep, sure was. The guy's hair was a little longer than it was in that picture, but it was definitely him. They didn't look to be getting along too well either. But Daryl was in here the night before with a woman. Could it have been his sister? I asked. If the missing Dahlia was here and didn't like the way her brother treated her boyfriend, maybe they got into it. That sounds like a pretty weak excuse for murder, though. 
Oh, she had way more reason than that to kill him, I said, then explained about the trust. That still doesn't explain the cabin, though. He lifted a shoulder. Lots of people like to run in those woods. The edge of the forest is close to town, and if somebody asks where a good place is, plenty of people will point them in that direction. Maybe he went for a run, his sister and her boyfriend followed him, and he stopped at the cabin to rest or grab something to eat. They caught him there, and bam, instantly rich. I had to say, it made much more sense than believing the poor kid currently sitting in my jail did it. The faint scent of perfume I'd smelled drifted back through my brain, and the final pieces clicked into place. I slugged the last of my beard down and pulled my backpack off the peg. I'll be back, Sully. Don't say anything to anybody yet, but I need to talk to a wolf about a man. Chapter 27 When I went to my jeep, there was a sign leaning against it with a big red no symbol with treaty written inside of it. Awesome. I wadded it up and stuffed it into the nearest garbage can. That was something I'd have to deal with later. Benjamin Stevens had said he worked from home, so I was hoping to find him there. Sure enough, his car was in the lot when I pulled in. I banged on his door. Benjamin, open up. It's Corey Sloan. I heard the thump of footsteps inside, and a few seconds later, the door swung open. Sheriff, what can I do for you? You can tell me where your girlfriend is, I said, pushing into his apartment. And while you're at it, you can go ahead and confess to killing her brother. I have it all worked out. I went through the scenario Sully and I had just worked out. That would be just fine and dandy he said. Except you're forgetting I haven't seen Dahlia except on FaceTime for almost a month. You say you haven't seen her. Why would I believe you when you lied to me about talking to her? I didn't lie to you. I raised my brows. Okay, I did lie to you, but not because we killed him. Then why? I asked. He hung his head. Because I thought maybe Dolly really did kill him, and I wanted to give her an alibi. The truth is, I haven't talked to her in almost three days. And why should I believe you now? I asked. I don't know, he answered. But it's all I've got for you. Do you think Dahlia could have done it? I asked. And don't lie to me. He shrugged his shoulders. I hate to think my judgment is that poor. But it's possible, I guess. I haven't known her that long, and I do know she resents that her brother controls all of her money. She thinks it should have been hers. Now that we have that squared away, let's move on to the second lie you told me, I said. He looked busted this time and held up his hands. All right, yes, I met Daryl. I didn't want to tell you because I figured that'd make me a prime suspect. So does lying, I said, glowering at him. Okay, well, then admitting that I'm the one who dropped him off at the field would make it even worse then, wouldn't it? I rubbed my forehead. Are you kidding me? Not even a little. I asked him if he needed a ride back, but he said no. I also asked if he wanted a running buddy since I knew the lay of the land, and he said no. It was still possible Dahlia did it, but she was in the wind and I had no proof. Except for that faint hint of perfume. I parked my truck at the station and went inside to talk to Buddy for a few minutes. Selena had been suspiciously absent, though I figured maybe she was still pouting in her room. She seemed the type to do something like that. I pulled up a chair in front of his cell, and he glanced up at me from his position on the bed. He looked so lost, and again my gut screamed that he was innocent. Buddy, I said, you have to give me something to help you. How did you get that blood on your shoe? He looked at his feet. If I tell you, it'll just make me look worse. He said, a breakthrough. 
I hate to tell you this, but right now, short of confessing to murder, nothing could possibly make you look worse. He took a few slow breaths, and I could tell he was thinking about it. I saw it happen, he said. Daryl came into the diner and asked me where a good place to run was. I told him about the Hutchinson place and even that sometimes there was soda and candy in the cabin. That made him real happy. He stopped as if that explained everything. And what happened the night he was killed, buddy? I was out after work. It was a nice night and I decided to go fishing. I figured the stream behind the cabin would be nice and quiet. Sometimes things get loud in my head, and I need a quiet place for a while. I could certainly understand that. I was fishing, and I heard two wolves. Then I saw them, a big one and a smaller one. They was playing and having a good time. He stopped and smiled, remembering. I wished Holly would come out and play with me like that. Imagining how he must have felt made me a little sad, but I shook myself. I needed to get the truth if I was going to save him. Do you know who the wolves were? I asked. He shook his head. Not for sure, but I don't think they were from around here. I'm in those woods a lot, and I know most folks who go there. Of course, I don't know them all, so they may be local. But do you think it was a male and a female? Oh, yes, ma'am, he said, nodding. They was real affectionate. Could they have been brother and sister? I asked. But he didn't even pause when he shook his head. No, it wasn't that type of affection. It was more boyfriend-girlfriend. They was rubbing noses and stuff. His face went a little pink. At least that explained why he didn't want Benjamin to hang out or give him a ride back. I was fishing, and I heard a big old ruckus coming from the cabin. By the time I got there, this wolf was attacking him, and he was trying to shove it off him. I was already shifted, so I went in and tried to stop it. It was like it didn't even see me, except to try to get me to turn her loose. I thought I had him and was digging my claws in all I could to keep Daryl safe, but then the one I was holding gave one good lunge and got him in the throat. His Adam's apple was bobbing as he stared off at something only he could see. You called this wolf him, I said. It was a male? He tilted his head, thinking. You know, now you mention it, I'm not sure. I know it wasn't the wolf he'd been with earlier. She was a pretty silver. The one that attacked him was dark gray, almost black. I reckon it could have been a female. It was kind of small. Then again, he looked down at himself. Most everything's small to me. That haunted look crept back over his face, and he continued the story. I wanted to help. But I was so scared, I just ran till I got to the stream and kept running till I got home. I was afraid she was going to kill me, too. I know Daryl was dead, because he shifted back to human almost as soon as... Well, you know. Running my hand through my hair, I thought about the claw marks on the floor. They were consistent with the story. So why didn't you come tell me? Or anybody. He looked at the floor. Because I was afraid you'd think I was lying. I know some people think I'm crazy, but I'm not. I just have a hard time talking, and it takes me a little longer to figure things out sometimes. I thought maybe you would thought I lost my mind and done it or something. Better just to do as I've always been told, mind my own business. Plus, he was dead. Wasn't like speaking up would fix that. I talked to him for a few more minutes. I couldn't release him from jail just on that. I decided to walk to the one coffee shop in town, Cup of Joe's. 
They'd recently begun experimenting with staying open later, though the owners, Mona and Joe, were usually only there in the morning. I walked down the familiar street, details of the case flitting around my head like confetti. I worked them, trying to get them just right. Benjamin Stevens was back on the table as far as I was concerned. He was a smaller man, and it was likely he was a smaller wolf, too. Maybe he and Daryl had gone running and something went wrong. Andre Glapian had known something he wasn't telling, and I wondered if that was it. Thinking of him reminded me of the shotgun and that gleam in his eye, and I decided it would be best if I called him. He didn't answer, and I was glad for the moment that Buddy was locked safely away. I was so engrossed in my speculations that I didn't even see the attack coming before it was too late. All I managed to catch was a faint whiff of perfume before everything went dark. Chapter 28 I woke up in a strange room, and when I tried to turn my head, strong hands braced both of my cheeks to keep me from doing it. I panicked for a minute until I realized somebody was talking to me. It was Kat. Be still, Corey, she said. You're going to be okay, but you have to give him time to heal you. Heal me? What the heck from? She must have seen the question in my eyes. You were attacked outside Mona's and, we're guessing, left for dead. Thankfully, Selena came looking for you to apologize and saw you crumpled on the sidewalk on her way to the courthouse. I shut my eyes and did my best to use the telepathy I'd been practicing. Kat was a pro at it, seeing as how she'd been doing it for 300 years, so it was easy enough. How do you know she wasn't the one who did it? I thought to her. Because people saw her drive up and jump out of her car. She blocked traffic. Another wave of panic washed over me. I couldn't feel anything. She must have read my mind because she said, It's okay. Sean put a block on your pain receptors so he could work on you, and so you wouldn't hurt yourself further. Great. Vampire Oxy. I had to admit, it worked better than any pain pill I'd ever taken. I felt nothing. Then it occurred to me that it must be bad if he did that. I thought as much to Kat. Her face was troubled. I'm not gonna lie, sweetie. It's bad. But you're going to live, and if Sean's past work is anything to go by, you won't even have many scars. Put her to sleep, I heard Sean say. I have to do a few unpleasant things, and even though her receptors are blocked, I don't want her awake for them. For once, I was willing to do whatever he said, and I thought as much to Cat. Okay, then. Look me in the eye, girlfriend, and know that when you wake up, things will be monumentally better. I did, and the last thing I remember was thinking how beautiful she was, inside and out. The next thing I knew, I was lying in my own bed and the shades were drawn. I started to groan, but my throat was parched. I smacked my lips a few times, but that didn't help. Here, have a drink of water, Kat said, holding a cup out to me. I grasped it a couple times before my fingers closed around it, but when they did, I drank almost the whole glass of water in one go. I flexed my body parts to see if I could feel them and to make sure they were all there. Feet? Good. Legs? Yup. Fingers? Totally wiggleable. I rolled my head, and that hurt a little. Yeah, Kat said. You may not want to do that for a few days. Sean did his best, but you were pretty Humpty Dumptyed. He managed to put you back together again, but even he couldn't completely heal you. I tried to push myself to a seated position. It didn't hurt exactly, but it wasn't comfortable either. I managed it, though, because I wanted to see for myself. I felt my face, which had a few tender spots and a scab or two, then ran my fingers down my throat. I could trace what felt like scratches that ran from behind my ear all the way to my collarbone. 
Tell me it doesn't look as bad as it feels, I said. I'll tell you that it looks fan flippantastic compared to what it looked like before Sean worked on you. Count yourself lucky he has 24-hour access to the local blood bank, because you sure didn't have much of your own left when we got to you. She hopped up from her chair and went into my bathroom, returning with my hand mirror. Just remember, you have more healing left to do. Between what Sean did and your werewolf healing, you should be fine in a few days. I took a deep breath before I looked and heaved a sigh of relief when I saw the damage was minimal. It looked like one or two of the cuts on my throat may leave thin scars, but the rest would likely heal completely. My face had a few cuts and bruises, but it too would heal. There were several long cuts on my arms, legs, and torso, and one particularly bad one on my stomach, but all would heal, like she said, with minimal scarring. What the hell happened to me? I asked. Best we could tell, a werewolf attacked you, she said. That was unfathomable to me. It broke every rule in the book and was punishable by death, along with some torture added in because I was an alpha if the old laws were followed. Did anybody see it happen? She shook her head. All we know is that it must have happened right before Selena saw you. Otherwise, you'd have bled out right then and there. As it was, Sean was barely able to save you. She gave a thin smile. As a matter of fact, I was about to give in to the temptation and turn you, but he wouldn't let me. That hit me like a ton of bricks. We talked about it, but only in a should I turn you if you're attacked by a thousand African honeybees kind of way. But now that I'd been there, I realized I'd much rather live on as a vampire than not at all. That's probably a discussion we should have. Just so you know, if it took that to save my life, I'd be okay with it. After all, some of the best people I knew were vampires. Do you remember anything at all about the attack? She asked. I shook my head. Nothing, except I smelled perfume. The same scent I smelled at the cabin. I glanced at the window. It was dark outside. How long have I been out? It's almost four in the morning, so about ten hours or so. Maybe a little less. I don't remember exactly what time it was when Alex called. Alex called? I thought Selena found me. She did, but she knew this wasn't exactly an injury the hospital could fix, so she called the only paranormal she knew. Then Alex called me. I was already at Sean's helping him decorate for his All Hallows' Eve party. The stars aligned for you, girlfriend. I feel like I could sleep for a week and like I could run a marathon at the same time, I said. How weird is that? She smiled. Not weird at all. Sean has a little special sauce he gave you to keep you from hurting and to help you heal faster, and that's sort of one of the side effects. Don't ask what's in it. I made that mistake once, and I wish I hadn't. Just trust that it's good stuff. Now that I was alert and getting my wits back about me, it occurred to me that I should be royally pissed. Good, I said. I have the energy, but am I healed enough to go find whoever did this and take them down? She cringed. Probably not just yet. I'd give it a day or so. Besides, any minute now, that euphoric wave is going to crash. Just as she said it, it happened. The surge of energy washed away, and all I felt was drained. Lie down and rest, she said as my eyes drifted closed. We're doing everything we can to track down who did this. My last thought was that if Sean had his resources out in full force, the bitch who did this better pray I got to her first. Chapter 29 Two days later, I was good as new. As predicted, the one gash on my neck, the one that would have probably killed me, left a thin white scar, as did the one on my belly. 
The rest healed, and if anything, I felt better than new. I'd considered calling and having Buddy released, but I was afraid whoever got to me would get to him. Instead, I went to Sully's. The smell of frying meat made my stomach growl, as always, and he smiled when he saw me, which made my heart happy. Having him mad at me, it felt horrible. He slid a glass of tea in front of me. It's good to see you, lass. We were afraid we'd lost you. One of my guys saw them carrying you into Mona's and reported back that you were dead. He reached over and laid his hand on mine. I'm sorry, Corey. I know you were just doing your job. Thanks, Sully. I appreciate that. And speaking of, I'm ready to release him, but we had a little talk right before I was attacked. He saw the whole thing go down, and I'm afraid the only thing that saved him the other night was that he was locked up. Do you have somewhere you can keep him safe if I release him? Otherwise, as bad as I hate to say it, I'd feel better keeping him in jail. Sully lifted one corner of his mouth, but his eyes filled with wrath. Let somebody come into our den and take one of our own. Aye, lass, I'll keep him safe. Don't you worry your head about that. I nodded. Then I need somebody to pick him up. Somebody that can protect him from here to wherever you're taking him. That'll be me, then, he replied. I have one of the girls coming in just a couple hours for her shift. I'll leave the place to her and take care of the lad myself. That works for me, I said. So do you have any leads? He asked. I pulled in a deep breath and released it slowly, puffing my cheeks. Not so's you'd notice, I said. Though I have my suspicions, I'm fairly certain his sister did it. The more I thought about Benjamin Stevens' story, the less I believed it. I think she and her boyfriend killed him for money. Stevens lured him there, and she did the deed. He furrowed his brow. That's tough, lass. Yeah, I said, and I've talked to some of Stevens' colleagues, too. It seems he's been fanning the flames of discontent this whole thing has caused about the treaty. He's been feeding off it and using it as a reason to turn people against it. Sully shook his head. I know it sure worked for us, I'm sad to say. I pulled in a deep breath and released it. You're not the only one, Sully, so don't feel bad. I heard Holly, the other girl who was attacked, came out of her coma, he said. She did, yesterday. I went to see her, and all she remembers is being hit from behind. I asked her if she noticed anything out of the ordinary, and she just mentioned the same thing I did, the perfume. He nodded. Her husband was in here yesterday, he said. He's relieved, and it looks like things are taking a turn for the better with them. Husband? I asked. I thought she was single. He waggled his hand side to side. Technically, she's married. They've been separated for six months or so, just trying to decide who gets what before they file for divorce. That gave me pause. Is he seeing anybody? Sully shook his head. That I couldn't tell you. He pinched his lips together for a second. I know what you're thinking, but that would only work for her. It wouldn't explain you or Daryl Beauchamp. I sighed. He had a point. My phone rang just as Sully slid my burger in front of me. It was Barnaby. Hello, Barnaby, I said. I owe your second in command my life as I understand it. He huffed. As far as I can see, it was the least she could do. I'm glad I have you on the line. I wanted to let you know before I do it that I'm releasing Buddy Langley. Selena, Alex, and I talked about it yesterday. We all agree that since I was mauled in the same fashion Daryl was, and Buddy was locked up in my jail, that clears him. I started to tell him about Buddy's confession, but held out. As far as I could tell, it had no relevance, and telling it would only alert more people that he was a witness. I agree, then. He replied without missing a beat. I trust Selena's judgment, at least in this matter. I spoke with her earlier, and I gave my blessing. Do you have any idea who attacked you? 
Selena and I had sat down and had a come-to-Jesus conversation the night before, and she'd admitted that she told several of her friends who were close to Daryl the details of the investigation. She'd thought she was being kind by keeping them updated, but when I knocked her on her ass that day, she'd thought about it and realized what the implications were. I don't know. Honestly, my money's on Dahlia. About that. Barnaby said, then cleared his throat. She just got back from a trip to Central America. She'd been on an island and lost her phone overboard. They didn't have modern amenities there, so she was unable to replace it without going to the mainland. Instead, she decided to unplug for a few days. I assume you followed up with that? I did, he said. The hotel on the mainland confirmed she was there the night the murder happened, and the ferry boat captain confirmed that he took her to the island first thing the next morning and didn't pick her up until yesterday morning. So she's clear of Daryl, Holly, Pierce, and me, I said. I'm afraid so. I'm also concerned. My pack is getting restless. His widow is leading a protest against the treaty because she says your tactics are ineffective and that she's afraid the coalition will weaken us as a pack. As a matter of fact, she's considering coming down there. So far, I've managed to stop her, but I won't be able to for much longer. Don't worry about it, I said. Let her come. She won't be able to do any more damage than what's already been done. The one good thing that came out of my attack is that it brought us all back together again. Between Sully and Dana, who had a ton of pull with the foxes, we were all back on the same page. Releasing Buddy would be the final egg in that basket that would draw the few outliers back in. Be careful what you wish for, Corey, he said. The woman's been a thorn in my backside for as long as I can remember. She's one of the most spoiled, entitled people I've ever known, and she's dead set on bringing the whole thing down around your ears if you don't solve her husband's murder. Let her bring it on, I said. It turns out I was glad she did, though probably not for the reasons you think. Chapter 30 Bright and early the next morning, Selina called. I thought you might want to know that Mandy's in town. She just checked into the hotel room next to mine. She says she's here and she's not leaving until you tell her everything you know about the case and you solve Daryl's murder. Great, I said. Can't wait to meet her. To be fair, Barnaby did warn me it wouldn't be long before she descended on me. Yeah, Selina said. She's a barrel of laughs. She paused. You know, she used to be one of my best friends, but lately, she's just nasty, mean and demanding and rude. I mean, she's always had those traits to a certain degree, but not like she's been lately. She's really pissed that we haven't solved this case. Well then, I said, let's give her what she wants. She said she's coming to your office and plans to stand outside with a picket sign about the treaty, and she's rallied some people to stand behind her. Oh, no way is that happening on her terms, I said. I'll be there in 15. If you don't want to go with me, I understand. It would be awkward for you. I'm representing my pack, she said. And you made me understand what that means. If she's here to start trouble then it's my job as the second-in-command of her pack to make sure she keeps it peaceful and respectful. Selina and I had spoken at length about the treaty and what it would mean, and though she'd been against it in the beginning, when Alex and I pointed out all the holes in the current system, she'd come around. Okay, then. I'll see you in 15. Alex had stayed the night at the house, so he was already there. Are we going somewhere? he asked. Yep, so get your shoes on. We have a snotty debutante to entertain. Oh, goody, he deadpanned. Just what I wanted to do with my Saturday. Chaos jumped from his lap. 
Something tells me I should go with you for this. I cast a sideways glance at her. Why? Are you sensing something bad's going to happen? The bad feeling I'd had disappeared the day after I was attacked. No, she said. I just love a good cat fight. I snorted. I hardly think it'll come to that. Yeah, she said. But I'm not going to risk missing it if it does. Well then, foxy lady, Alex said. Let's get this show on the road. She hopped onto his shoulder, I grabbed my backpack, and we left. Thirteen minutes later, Selena and Alex, with chaos on his shoulder, were standing behind me as I pounded a bit louder than necessary on Mandy's door. She swung it open, glaring at us. Who are you? she asked. I believe we've spoken on the phone. I'm Sheriff Corey Sloan, and this is Alex Dixon. And I believe you know Selena. She wrinkled her nose. What do you want? I shrugged. I figured you made the trip all the way down here, so I'd put forth the effort to greet you personally. She heaved a put-upon sigh and swung the door open. Come in, then. I hope you're ready to share every shred of information you have. I stepped into the room and hadn't made it past the foot of the bed before I stopped in my tracks and sniffed. Turning to her, I narrowed my eyes. What's that scent you're wearing? Is it new? She waved a hand. No, it's a special blend an aromatherapist makes for me at home. I've worn it for years. She says it promotes wealth and success. I turned to Alex and caught Chaos's eye. We'd been working on our telepathy, too. It's her, I said to both of them. She'd been half asleep on his shoulder, but her eyes became alert as the hair on her scruff stood up. She jumped down, and Alex assumed a stance that would make for an easy change if necessary. Mandy must have just noticed chaos. Get that mangy animal out of my room! I have allergies! Not to murder, apparently. I turned to Selena. That scent, the one she just said especially made for her, is the same scent my attacker was wearing and that I smelled in the cabin. She crouched and started to change, but before she could, I was behind her with more speed than I knew I possessed and had her hands in charmed cuffs. Amandine Beauchamp, you're under arrest for the murder of Daryl Beauchamp and the attempted murder of myself and Holly Pierce. I read her her rights. Selena just stared, dazed, as I did so. Why, Mandy? He was cheating on me, the bastard, she said. Me! I came down here to surprise him when he came to visit Andre. I thought maybe we could have a cozy little mountain lake vacation. But when I got here, it was him with that little tramp Holly Pierce. I followed them to the cabin where I caught them in the act. I wanted to kill them both right then, but didn't think I could beat them. So I waited for her to leave and got him. Her lip curled. That stupid bear damn near stopped me, and I would have killed him too if I could have found him afterward. I caught her in her yard, but had to run when her roommate came home. I thought I'd killed her anyway, then that stupid twit went and lived. She turned to me, disdain and hatred in her eyes. You, I just tried to kill you because you had the potential to actually solve this thing if Holly woke up and admitted to the affair. Plus, I don't like you. Yeah, well, likewise, I said. Alex and Chaos were looking at me, matching thoughtful expressions on their faces, but neither of them said anything. Selena, for her part, was on the phone with Barnaby, explaining what had happened. After all was said and done, I called Mom to let her know we'd wrapped it up and that the treaty was still a go, and that, if anything, people were more committed to it now than ever. This was a serious case where multiple packs would have been involved, fighting over who had jurisdiction. The treaty, which was signed into effect the next day, solved that problem. Everything worked out just the way it should have. Chapter 31 
It was Halloween, and Alex and I had decided to celebrate it the new old-fashioned way. We dressed up, invited some friends over, and handed out candy. The night was a resounding success, and after all the kitties were home in bed and all the party-goers were gone, we spread a blanket in the backyard to have our own little party. I'd brought out some snacks and a bottle of wine, and nature was providing all the music we needed. The eclipse was over, and all that was left was a huge blue moon bathing the yard in light so bright we could have seen even without wolf vision. I sat between Alex's legs, my head leaned back on his chest. Chaos was laying on the blanket beside us, content for once to just relax rather than eat. So... Alex said, his breath tickling the top of my head. I've been meaning to ask, what was with the super speed in the room the other day? I smiled, though he couldn't see me. I was wondering about it, too. Kat says it's probably a side effect from one of the meds Sean gave me. Apparently, there are some questionable ingredients in it that aren't necessarily made for consumption by any creatures other than vampires. But... Since it was all he had, it's what he used. Will it go away? Chaos asked. Sean doesn't seem to think so. He said anything in the meds should have passed through my system within the first day or so. So now you're super fast as well as super beautiful, super smart, and super sexy? Alex asked. I grinned. It would seem so. Twisting around, I gave him a kiss, smiling against his mouth as I did so. He wrapped his arms around me and kissed me back. I'll take it, he said. A murderer was caught, the moon was full, and I was sharing it with the two beings closest to me in the world. I'd take it too. This has been Bad Moon Rising. A Cory Sloan Witch Mystery. Cory Sloan Witch Mysteries Book 3. Written by Tegan Marr. Narrated by Megan Kelly. Copyright 2018 by Tegan Marr. Production copyright by Tegan Marr.